EIDS. For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERPI has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <sighs> Pag nanulit tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isa ilalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. 
Dito pumapasok ang tungkulin na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERPI has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <sighs> Pag nangulit tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan 
o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isa ilalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan Bago pa man ito ipatupad, dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the PIDS webinar series. We trust that all of you are safe and in good health. I'm Sheila Siyar, and I will be your moderator. Friends, uh, for several weeks, we have been unpacking the opportunities and challenges brought about by the rise of the digital economy. Last week, if you will recall, we had a thought-provoking discussion on taxation. For today, we will look at gender and other issues in platform work, and we will also revisit the results of the National ICT Household Survey at the individual level. 
To formally open our event, I now give the floor to Dr. Celia Reyes, the president of PIDS. Ma'am Cel? Thank you, Sheila. Good afternoon, everyone. Allow me to begin by first acknowledging the presence of the following. I'm National Economic and Development Authority Director Florante Igtiben, Department of Information and Communications Technology Director Philip Varilla, Commission and Higher Education Director Nelson Kainhol, Department of Science and Technology Provincial Director Raul Castaneda, Department of Tourism Regional Director Woodrow Makili, Philippine Statistics Authority Regional Director Wilma Perante, Senate Economic Planning Office Director Cerces Nitafan, Provincial Administrator Catherine Piaquinto of Bohol, and from the private sector, Felta Multimedia Systems President and CEO and Infocom Technology Association of the Philippines Director Mylene Abiva. From the academy, we have University of the Philippines Law Center, Islamic Law Studies Director Salma Pirasul, UP Center for Women's and Gender Studies Deputy Director for Training and Outreach, Excel Satongson, UP Los, ba um, UP Los Baños uh, Director Jane Reyes, Marinduque State College President Josdado Zulueta, Far Eastern University Director Catherine Catamora, Benguet State University Director for Gender and Development Estrelita Daclan, Central Bico State University of Agriculture Planning Director Emerson Bergonio, Southern Luzon State University Director Susana Salvacion. From the Cavite State University, we have Gender and Development Resource Center Director Susan Tan, Planning Office Director Orlando de los Reyes, and International and Local Collaboration and Linkages Office Director Maria Soledad Lising. From the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, we have Director Rufo Buesa, Director Barbara Camacho, Director Mercedes Camilo Campo, and Director Maria Luisa Oliveros, Dean Jocelyn Rivera Lutap, and Dean Walhati de la Cruz. From SLSU, we have Dean Renato Maali and uh, Dean Shuela Manzanilla and Dean Chona Kayabat. And from Malay College, uh, we have Dean Jimmy Maming, and um, we also have Philippine Normal University Associate Dean Zirali Bedural. Um, we have with us also this afternoon Asian Development Bank Philippines National Gender Consultant Claire Angeline Luxon, World Bank Lead Economist Asha Aklake, World Health Organization Philippines Technical Coordinator Stella Osorio, Phil Export Executive Assistant Vice President Maria Fleur de Lisa Leong, Foundation for Media Alternatives Executive Director Lisa Garcia, and Masaganang Sakahan Director Danielle Agustin. Let me also greet our guest colleagues from the government, academe, civil society, media, private sector, as well as those who are watching through the PIDS Facebook page. Welcome to our webinar. In the Global Gender Gap Report 2020 of the World Economic Forum, the Philippines ranked 16 out of 153 countries with the narrowest gap between men and women. It is the only Asian country that made it to the top 20. Nevertheless, a closer look on the ground would reveal that we still have a lot to improve on, particularly in terms of women's economic participation. The 2019 Labor Force Survey shows that only around 51% of women at least 25 years old are working, a figure that is much lower than men's, which is 81%. This relatively low figure can be attributed to housework and care work, which are mostly performed by women, as reported by Dr. Connie Bayudan Dakwekoy and Ms. Laura Bahe in their previous studies. With the rise of the digital economy, new business models like those carried out using online platforms provide opportunities for women to participate in the labor market. In fact, the study of Dr. Dakwekoy and Ms. Bahe and their earlier paper on the same topic have shown that women are more likely to participate in platform work than men because it offers them economic opportunities whilst they're performing work. They have a higher probability of working on the platform than men. During the current reveals the significant potential of platform work 
to increase women's economic participation, especially at this time when widespread loss of income and unemployment is rising. However, as their study also reveals, platform work is not without issues. It can potentially exacerbate existing gender inequalities given the lack of guarantee of secure income flow and social protection in platform work, which is mostly based on contracts. We must consider this red flag now while more women are becoming engaged in platform work. Apart from this, it is crucial to address job security and social protection in this new work arrangement. Meanwhile, the other study that we will tackle today is the paper of Dr. Aubrey Cabuga and Mr. Carlos Caballero on their analysis of ICT use in the country based on the National ICT Household Survey conducted in 2019. Among their most important findings are the non-negligible proportion of individuals who do not have access to ICT, partly due to lack of infrastructure, lack of knowledge being the foremost reason for not using the internet, and the small percentage of individuals who are using ICT for doing online financial transactions or conducting business. We could probably expect some improvements from these pre-pandemic findings as everyone was forced to use ICT and go digital during the pandemic. Nevertheless, the fact remains that digital divide remains a significant issue in the Philippines, especially among the poor and marginalized sectors. To enrich our discussion this afternoon, we invited representatives from the private and government sectors. I'd like to thank Executive Director Ama Karisma Satumba of the Department of Labor and Employment's Institute of Labor Studies and Ms. Rochefel Rivera, Chairperson of the Filipino Online Professional Service Cooperative for accepting our invitation. I'm sure we will learn a lot from your insights. Please also allow me to acknowledge the International Development Research Center or IDRC for collaborating with us. Their support enabled PIDS to produce the two papers that will be presented today. We will hear more about the PIDS IDRC research project from their senior program manager, Ms. Jillian Dowie, who will speak next. To our guests, thank you for joining us. Let us have an open and inquiring mind as we listen to the presentations and comments and use this opportunity to learn from one another. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you very much, Poncel. As uh, what she mentioned, the studies that will be uh, presented today uh, were supported by the International uh, Development uh, Research Center of uh, the Canadian government. And here to give us a background of the um, collaboration is Ms. Jillian Dawi, um, Senior Program Officer of IDRC's Sustainable Inclusive Economist Team uh, based in Delhi. Um, she manages a portfolio of research on innovative uh, social and economic development interventions with a focus on women's economic empowerment across South in, and Southeast Asia. Jillian, the floor is now yours. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Sheila. And thank you, everybody, for inviting me to share some reflections today. And of course, to Dr. Reyes as well for your remarks and to the entire team at PIDS for all of the work to organize this interaction. It's been it's great to be online with everybody, and I'm looking forward to the presentations by Connie and Aubrey and to hear from the discussants and from all of the audience members as well. The IDRC has a long history of research on ICT for development, AI for development, broadly the role of technology in, in, in sort of low-income contexts and communities. We recently launched uh, a new 10-year strategy that puts research on the role of technology as a cross-cutting and central theme across all of our areas of work, food systems, education and science systems, governance, health, and low-carbon economies. My team, Sustainable Inclusive Economies, as Sheila mentioned, see that technological and digital innovation is changing the nature of work and changing the shape of our economies in really important and fast moving ways. And this has been accelerated by COVID-19. The need for distancing pushed a lot of enterprises to shift online more rapidly than they might have otherwise to survive. Um, it also pushed a lot of services online, not just shopping, um, but also health consultation, government systems, and even schooling for children of, of all ages. And this forced citizens and families to adopt technology at a much higher rate or to upgrade their, their technology or learn, learn better how to use it. But importantly, it also inevitably left a lot of people behind. 
the digital divide globally within, within countries is still very large, especially for use of smartphones and more advanced technology. Uh, those who could access and use the technology did fare better this past year than those who couldn't. And on top of that, many countries right now are actually adopting digital systems, for example, for vaccine booking, for booking vaccine appointments, um, which, which just assume a certain level of skill and access and time availability. If, if you know, in some places mm -hmm. you're constantly just refreshing. Um, and that's also going to leave a lot of people behind, even in the, in the process of trying to come out of the, out of the pandemic. This kind of division is what drove us at IDRC to develop the Women Work and the Gig Economy Initiative, albeit before COVID-19 actually hit. The initiative looks closely at the implications of the digital economy, especially the gig economy, um, from a gender lens. The digital economy is still fairly new. It's somewhat nas nascent in a sense um, and still changing and accelerating in ways that we can and can't predict right now. But what is clear is that the future of work will be much more digital and policymakers, private sector actors and workers need to be able to keep up with the pace of change and need to be able to shape how that change happens, how economies evolve towards digitization and technological um, adoption, I guess. These digital systems though are built on many of the same assumptions and, and the same kinds of biases that are already present in, present in the sort of traditional offline economy where women are disadvantaged in so many ways. The gender wage gap is high globally. Women are segregated into specific sectors and jobs that are more feminized and, and typically as a result often get a lower value and especially into informal work. Women are responsible for the bulk of unpaid and care work. And in some contexts, there are other more social and cultural barriers to women leaving the house to find work. On the other hand, digital work very likely does offer flexibility in, in work hours and location, though evidence shows increasingly that to be truly successful in the, in the kind of digital economy, you do need to be available at fairly rigid hours. It also likely does offer chances to upgrade skills, enter new areas of work, generate a higher income, and potentially create an avenue to formal work arrangements for, for a lot of people. But for this to be true, for this to really take place and to, to lead to sort of net benefits for the digital economy to actually be inclusive, to increase space for women and promote gender equality, we need really intentional guidance and regulation from policymakers. We need the cooperation of platforms in creating systems that support the needs of women workers. And we need the workers themselves to be able to share their experience and provide feedback into those platforms, to have those platforms actually reflect their needs. The Women Work and the Gig Economy Initiative seeks to build the evidence base on how digital platforms can enhance women's economic empowerment and build gender inclusive labor markets. Five research teams covering seven countries in Asia are conducting research on different aspects of gender in the digital economy. This includes women's collectivization using digital tools and platforms, the ecosystem, the wider ecosystem of digital work, which includes policies for gig workers and, and occupations that were difficult to imagine before like home cooks being able to share their food across an entire city or online sellers, different kinds of online sellers. Uh, the kinds of design features on apps that improve or hinder women's ability to work better on their own terms. And the impact of all of these changes on women in rural areas and in, and in lower income working roles. The three main goals of the initiative are to one, deepen our understanding of the challenges and opportunities that women face in accessing and benefiting from work opportunities through digital platforms. Two, to, to discover innovations, practices, and solutions that platforms may use to create higher quality inclusive work. And three, to collaborate directly with policymakers, online enterprises, and workers to scale proven solutions through better design and regulation of labor practices. By, by managing and disseminating research across all of the partner institutions who are involved, this consortium of, of research, researchers, research institutions, aims to create a network of researchers, policymakers, and private sector actors who are working towards a more equitable future of work uh, through evidence, advocacy, and, and knowledge sharing. <clears throat> And of course, the team here at the Philippine Institute for Development Studies is one of the five teams part of the initiative. Today, I'm really looking forward to hearing the first research findings from the Philippines, these two reports that are coming out. 
Um, we know that there is a large presence of workers from the Philippines in digital work of different kinds. Uh, and understanding more deeply the way that that gender dynamics play out, the benefits and challenges for workers, the access gaps, the skills implications, all of this will be really important as more and more of this kind of work um, shifts online. So this is a really valuable contribution and I'm really looking forward to hearing about it. Um, I also wanna congratulate the team at PIDS on adapting so well to the context of doing research and collecting data during a pandemic. Uh, this has been such a difficult time to be doing this kind of work, uh, but the research team has managed to still produce these excellent reports and have adapted their plans to be able to move ahead with the rest of their work. It's so important that we actually witness and collect data that may even tell us about the experience of workers in the past year and their experiences as we eventually slowly begin to come out of this the sort of emergency period that we're in. So I wanna thank you again to the entire P uh, PIDS team and I'm looking forward to hearing from our presenters today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. Okay, so friends, um, let us now proceed to uh, the first presentation. And uh, we will have first a study on gender issues in crowd work, which was authored by Dr. Connie Bayudin de Kui Kui and uh, Ms. Laura Bahe. And to present the study is uh, is Dr. Um, Connie Dakuikui, who is a senior uh, research fellow at PIDS. She is a development economist, um, and she focuses on issues related to gender and the family, poverty and social protection, and structural transformation. Prior to joining uh, PIDS, Dr. Dakuikui was an assistant professor at the economics department of the Ateneo de Manila University and a consultant at the Asian Development Bank. She obtained her PhD in economics at Kyoto University. Connie, the floor is now yours. Hi, Sheila. Can you hear? Okay, thanks. So before I begin, um, uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for attending this webinar. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge first my collaborator, Ms. Laura Cruz Bahe, um, and then express gratitude to the IDRC for funding this research. Um, and then uh, thank you also to, uh, should go to Ms. Lucita Melendez of the PIDS for overall assistance and to Ms. Mary, Mary Rose Castro of the DICT for helping us roll out the online survey. Without her help, for sure, uh, this paper would not have been possible. So, um, uh, the PIDS, as I uh, already mentioned, had several webinars on digitization and digital platforms this year. So some of you may be familiar with some of the slides, but uh, still I will briefly show it just to motivate the discussion. So in the next slide, um, I think that the best way to start the discussion is to provide some stylized facts on uh, gender in the Philippines. So uh, the Philippines has several mi milestones in terms of women empowerment and gender equality. And in fact, it has already achieved gender uh, parity in the education front, although critical gender gaps remain. And uh, one of these uh, gaps would be the low women's labor force participation, which is um, currently the lowest in the uh, yeah, Southeast Asia. So based on the World Bank's uh, world development indicators, um, in 1994, it's around 47%, and in 2020, it's around 46%, so not much uh, um, development there. And it reached around 50%, uh, it's the highest in 2014. In, in part, this is uh, validated uh, by the 2019 LFS, uh, October round, uh, as mentioned already by Mamsel, 51% uh, of women at least uh, 25 years old are working versus the 81% um, uh, 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 men's 81%, and this can be attributed to housework. So 74% of women uh, have expressed household and uh, family duties as main reasons for not looking for work, versus only 15% uh, saying that that's the reason. Um, in, uh, and at the same time, there's an evidence on pay gap. Uh, although uh, it's not conclusive in terms of favoring a specific gender. So there are studies that says that um, uh, there's a gender pay, pay gap in favor of men, and there are studies that would say that there is a gender pay gap in favor of women. So this study is not really that conclusive. Um, next slide, please. Next slide.
Next slide, please. Ah, sorry. Uh, back, back. Third slide. All right. Okay. So, um, okay. One more. Okay. So, one more. Okay. Um, so uh, here, uh, I just we just want to say that the ICT developments have paved the way for uh, the development of digital platforms. And um, these digital platforms, they bring together markets, markets for tangible goods, non-tangible goods, and labor. So the paper that uh, we'll be um, discussing here today would be on labor platforms. That, that will be our uh, focus. The, on uh, labor platforms, there are at least two types of work on demand work and crowd work so the on demand work um, uh, these are work that requires close interaction between workers and demanders and platforms need to access uh, domestic physical infrastructures to operate so uh, they are subject to local rules and regulation whereas crowd work uh, entirely commissioned uh, commissioned by firms and is entirely transacted and delivered online so under uh, crowd work there are two types of tasks macro tasks which require specialized skills and the contract uh, contract price is negotiable. While um, micro tasks, uh, these are tasks that are routinary in nature and the contract price is not negotiable. So between the two, on-demand work and crowd work, it's the crowd work that, that's a little bit challenging in terms of enforcing the national uh, labor laws that are designed to ensure decent work because transactions are uh, cross-border. Nevertheless, there are benefits from digital labor platforms one it gives access to economic opportunities uh, to people who may otherwise not have opportunities uh, in the labor market it boasts of uh, flexible working hours of supervision and um, reduction of financial and health costs associated with travel and road congestions it can also help uh, to achieve sdg targets that are related to women empowerment and gender equality um, and, and it can also address the age-old conflict of market and non-market work. Um, and at the same time, if correctly used, it can help in developing skills that are relevant to uh, offline work. Next slide, please. So despite the, uh, uh, despite the uh, benefits that we've already mentioned, there are some challenges for, uh, on platforms because there are, are asymmetries that result in structural inequalities and issues on decent work. So what are these asymmetries? Uh, value asymmetry because most of the value, uh, the value occurs most to platforms and to firms and the least to the workers. Risk asymmetry because uh, all the risks are borne by workers, um, protect, uh, social protection coverage, training investments, production cost, uh, information asymmetry because platforms manage and control uh, all the information that will be available to the market. Um, and of course, if there's information asymmetry, there's also power asymmetry. Now there is also uh, there are also issues uh, like for example there's a lack of collective representation uh, of workers on the platform and this is uh, it, this really makes sense because workers are are coming from different parts of the world and it's really difficult to put them together in one room in order to to form a group to have the social dialogue and collective bargaining. Um, so there are also no, no mechanisms on platforms to resolve disputes and redress grievances. And again, um, the, the absence of plat, uh, platform-led skills and career development and uh, uh, limited or absent social protection. Um, next slide, please. So the issues that I have mentioned earlier are actually uh, issues that are not unique to the platform world. Uh, and these issues are also not new. Because, for example, the precariousness arising from the lack of social protection, uh, this was a norm that uh, was observed in the early industrial revolution uh, when piecemeal work and task-based payments was uh, was common. So it, it, it's not the, the issues are not new, the issues are not unique. What is really new and unique is the way how these old practices are facilitated facilitated and how work is organized. So um, in the uh, on the platforms, uh, big jobs or big tasks are broken down into simple tasks. And these uh, platforms, they sell to clients who benefit from, from this because of, of the labor ar arbitrage. And then uh, these platforms, they use algorithmic data management to save on the cost of management of human resources and tasks, quality control, uh, rejection of outputs, and even the review and rating systems. Uh, rejection of outputs, very important or uh, very important because it, it uh, 
helps uh, workers to to find future uh, secure uh, work uh, future work rather on the platform similar story for review and rating systems because it, it helps uh, workers to build rep uh, their reputation on the platform and be able to, to uh, secure uh, future work as well on the platform. Uh, next slide, please. So here we just want uh, we, we just wanted to share uh, some of the findings from our uh, review of the related literature in terms of uh, uh, there's still no consensus on which gender is present more on the platform. It depends on the economy, uh, platform, age or tasks. Um, uh, there are also high quit the women also uh, are found to have high quit rates. Uh, and then there's a gender pay gap, and this gender pay gap is uh, really uh, conclusive in the sense that uh, women freelancers or women online workers they receive lower um, uh, they they, they re receive lower remuneration compared to men. At the same time, uh, geographical location uh, also there's a pay gap that exists in the sense that crowd workers from North America, Europe, and Central Asia they they earn more than those uh, from Africa and the Asia and the Pacific. Um, next slide, please. So uh, the uh, issue uh, on platform work platform work is still at its nascent stage. It's still evolving as uh, as Jillian uh, mentioned earlier. It's still emerging and evolving and really providing answers to questions. For example, how do we ensure that these new business models will not exacerbate inequalities? Uh, what can be done to realize the full potential of platform work uh, in achieving women empowerment and gender equality? So these are the questions that we would like to have uh, answers to. Unfortunately, because platform work is still emerging, it's still evolving, it's, there are challenges in more, uh, to, to really address these questions because under this uh, setting, um, it's really heterogeneous in scope and complexity and there's still no consensus in terms of definition and methodologies for data collection. So uh, what we did was, uh, in our mind, a good starting point when we have this, when you have these issues in our mind, a good starting point is to first leverage on proposed survey just to characterize workers and the work that they do. Um, and then the, the issue here is that to be just for us to be able to enhance the visibility of issues uh, and initiate the conversation on the necessary steps to ensure that policies and programs adjust to this, this new form of work arrangement. And so what we did was um, we conducted an online survey of market and non-market work uh, last year from May to December. This is in collaboration with the ICT Literacy and Competency Development Bureau of the DICT. So the DICT uh, conducts the Digital Jobs PH program, which uh, aim to assist economically disadvantaged areas and rural communities through the creation and promotion of ICT enabled jobs. So the online survey uh, is a rider activity to this uh, uh, digital jobs training in 2020. Now, um, uh, uh, at this point, what we want to say is um, this is a purposive uh, survey. It's non-random sampling. And therefore, all the results that we're going to share with you today are not generalizable to the whole population uh, it, it, because it's very difficult uh, to, to find the sampling frame for this type of workers. This is not like we're looking for households or we're not looking for firms, but we are looking for specific type, very specific type of workers that uh, may or may not want themselves uh, to be uh, seen or be, become visible. So the, in, uh, the intent of the online survey is only to describe uh, some results based on our conditional and, and unconditional analysis. Um, and then all our interpretations, um, all these caveats should hold. Now, the good news is that despite the non-representativeness of the online survey samples, most of the findings uh, that we have are consistent with the broad findings of studies abroad that use nationally representative uh, survey. Um, next slide, please. So here uh, we just want to show that there are around 855 completed responses uh, and uh, the respondents are, are combinations of people who have platform work only, uh, people who have non-platform work only, respondents who have both platform and non-platform work, and uh, respondents who have no uh, work, uh, market work whatsoever. So the reasons for, uh, their main reasons for attending the, the, the ICT training would be uh, they have future plans in engagement, uh, in using 
online tools for businesses and in engagement in platform work. We also ask people why they are not involved in any platform work, and there are three major reasons that they have cited. Um, lack of opportunities, that's one. Uh, the two is inadequate skills, and three, connectivity issues, which appear to be higher in rural communities. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So men and women, uh, they have uh, uh, they have been affected by the uh, by the COVID-19. Uh, however, uh, a higher percentage of so, but but there are the, the differences uh, in the sense that a higher percentage of women have indicated they suffered financial oppor or of opportunity losses. Uh, op opportunity or financial losses. This uh, means that they uh, they lost contract, they lost trainings. Um, the reduction in terms of wa uh, wage, reduction in terms of work hours. Uh, a higher percentage of women also have indicated hampered mobility and issues on access to services, whereas a higher percentage of men have experienced unemployment and have reported depletion of savings due to the lack of income. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of uh, reduction of online work, in terms of online work, rather, a similar percentage of men and women have indicated a reduction of online work. Around 23% of the respondents, both men and women, uh, they indicated termination of contract, loss of clients, reduction of work hours in platform work. Um, and this uh, uh, reduction in online work is connected with, for example, it's aggravated by issues on connectivity and limited mobility because of the lockdown. Um, the, because the lockdown have um, forced people to stay in one place that can have connectivity issues or without technicians to troubleshoot connection problems. Now, uh, this uh, reduction uh, in online work is an expected outcome of global slowdown. Um, but there are studies in 2020 uh, that, that uh, show there are certain types of online work that are resilient. Um, macro tasks such as software development technology were um, they, they were affected, but they were resilient in the sense that they were able to bounce back. But there are certain types of uh, online work that uh, have been ha adversely affected. It significantly uh, 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 significantly have significantly reduced. Uh, these include uh, creative uh, and multimedia, and sales and marketing support. So the bad news is that based on the online labor index uh, collected by the Oxford University, more, uh, a bulk of uh, bulk of the Filipino workers, online Filipino workers, are in these areas, uh, creating multimedia and sales and marketing. In part, this is validated by our online survey, where we can, where a lot of our respondents are doing clerical and data data entry and creative and multimedia and internet and sales and marketing support. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. <clears throat> So there are the motivations in online work participation differ between men and women as well. So both men and women, they indicated savings from uh, travel costs and better pay uh, as, uh, as um, their motivations. But um, women, uh, a higher proportion of them have done platform work due to housework and due to the pursuit of other interests. Whereas for men, it's the pursuit of other interests that is the main consideration and only a very small uh, proportion, percentage of the respondents have indicated um, uh, housework to be their main motivation. Next slide, please. So the challenges faced by men and women on platforms are not the same as well. So for example, for women, uh, of, of, of both men and women rather, uh, they, they indicated connectivity as, as uh, the, their main majority, a majority of them have indicated uh, connectivity uh, as the main challenge. But for women, um, uh, more, more women or more respondents have indicated the inadequacy of social protection. Uh, and then a um, higher proportion of women also have indicated uh, the issues of inadequacy of skills. Whereas for men, it's more of time management uh, arising from the presence of too many platform works uh, and having a full time job. Um, next slide, please. So uh, the good thing about uh, 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 platform work is that it can be done alongside non-platform work or uh, offline work, uh, and then the, these non-platform work can be 
a source of social protection uh, for for workers, for platform workers. So that's the good news. Um, but it's not uh, so much a good news for women because we know that in the Philippines, social protection is largely tied to formal employment. Uh, and we know also uh, based on um, in our discussion, uh, uh, our earlier discussion, that women's labor force participation is very low. It is around uh, 46 percent, uh, and those who work around 50 percent of them are own account workers. So this means that um, it displays that fewer women uh, have insurance and pension coverage. Uh, have fewer fewer women rather have insurance and pension coverage, and fewer women have access to consumption smoothing mechanisms like memberships to cooperative. And in part, this is uh, validated by um, the results of the online survey, where relative to their male counterparts, a smaller percentage of female respondents without non-platform work contribute to social security uh, fund. Um, and then there are also commonly cited reasons for non-subscription. So because people are wondering why they are not uh, subscribing uh, to social security Funds. And, and here we found that um, it's a combination of many factors, but the, um, um, but the um, ma major, um, the major uh, factor would be budget constraints. So for example, they have financial struggles and they don't have stable jobs, uh, they don't have stable income, and it feeds into the attitude as well, this budget constraint. So therefore they don't prioritize, they're not interested, um, and then the lack of information certainly uh, do not help uh, 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 workers to appreciate uh, uh, social protection schemes. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so here uh, we just uh, look into the dynamics of uh, uh, platform work, and we found that majority of the respondents have current platform engagements that are similar to their past platform work. So based on the the, if you can see the um, the highlighted diagonal, uh, most of the figures, most of the out of the numbers are non-zeros, are, uh, are are focused along on the along the diagonal, and then this this shows that whatever it is that you did in the past, more likely are the same job that you will be uh, doing now. We also did a conditional um, analysis, and we found that past experience on the platform is an important uh, determinant in the current platform in, uh, involvement. So the takeaway here is that um, one, skills development and training are really important because these determine whether uh, workers will be able to secure a job, that's one. And two, if ever they uh, secure a job, what kind of job they will end up doing. And, and second uh, takeaway here is that just like the story of the social protection coverage, um, skills development can be availed from workers' other market work. So mean, uh, it means, and this makes sense, because if you're working in a formal workplace, then that means that you practice, you interact, you have interaction, you have collaboration, and you practice. Um, and, and so you develop skills uh, along the way. But again, this is good news, but not so much for women, because of we've already, as we have already pointed out, um, uh, um, only 50% of them are on the are, are on the labor force and the, those who end up working are our own account. So, so th there are, are issues uh, uh, in the sense that uh, female respondents, they are more likely to participate in platform work. And, and if that is the case, then this puts forth the issue on how they can secure the job or what type of, or what type of jobs they can secure on the platform and whether we can sustain work on the platform. Next slide, please. So here we just uh, showed some uh, we just uh, showed some uh, analysis on platform work, and we found that by based on the te test of means, there are, uh, women are spending more time than men uh, on the platform, and this uh, has something to do with the flexibility. Although the benefits of flexibility in platform it appears uh, limited because we also looked at uh, the conditional on the. Uh, care economy or care work, we found that uh, beyond one to three hours of care work, the hours spent in platform work decline and approach zero. So it's really um, it's really uh, minimal. The, there's uh, the work done on platform is only done side by side minimal care work. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so here uh, we just uh, we just wanted to show that there is uh, we look also at the compensation per hour and we found that there is no gender difference. That's good news. Uh, once personal and platform attributes are controlled for, this is actually um, uh, consistent with uh, the result of uh, some of the ILO study. Um, the compensation per hour we also found uh, uh, received by the respondents, we also found that it's really higher relative to the compensation prevailing in the country. Uh, it's higher than the Philippine minimum wage in 2020. It's higher than the basic pay of a professional, which we uh, computed in another paper. Although here, um, uh, the bad, the not so bad, not so good news is that we the compensation per hour received by the respondents uh, is higher, uh, uh, rather on par with the rate of international platforms that are known for outsourcing routine tasks. So you can see there that the kind of value that's being fetched by our uh, online workers. Next, uh, next slide, please. So here, this is the last slide. Ways forward, uh, we just want. I just wanted to point that you know, you just emphasize that the issues and challenges faced by women uh, cut across many di uh, dimensions. Um, so, for example, if you talk about labor concerns, uh, social protection, and skills development, it naturally touches on gendered issues. Thus, the ways forward that I will be uh, sharing with you today must be given in broader context. So both men and women will benefit from the development of training systems and social protection systems, although women will benefit more. And so I'd like to say four things. Uh, one is on the skills development. It has critical role, one, in securing a job on the platform, in getting one that has a higher value added, and on the sustainability of platform work as well. And therefore, there is a need for a national initiative that's related to skills and training system. So uh, we were, I'm, and here I'm echoing uh, the importance of having this national upskilling program. Uh, one is we need to have to adopt a whole of society approach, meaning collaboration of all stakeholders to ensure that the training um, and skill systems will adapt to the evolving needs of global and local labor markets. Two is leverage digital platforms, develop skills and training systems to efficiently bring together private and public providers to serve the demand for skills and training. And three, build on the existing programs and initiatives. We have the digital job speech program. We have the Philippine Talent Map Initiative. There are building they, they, these programs. They have the building blocks that can be used in designing a skill system that is comprehensive and integrated with all the actors. And, and fourth, learn from the skills development, uh, skills program of other countries, just like the skills future in Singapore. So that's the first one. The social protection, the, we just, I just want to emphasize that there are many attributes of social protection systems, but the one that is more relevant to crowd work would be flexibility and port portability. And then for care work, um, the issue on care work, uh, it goes beyond crowd work, actually, because care work, it affects women regardless of their work arrangement. One, it is the main reason why women, um, especially married uh, women, they are not participating in the labor market. And as we have already seen, it also puts a limit on how much uh, uh, workers can put into their platform work. So it's really important to support women who are working already. And there are already uh, initiatives and programs that can be Further it strengthens, so for example, good and reliable child care services uh, that coincide with the office schedule. Uh, the institutionalization of uh, four-day work can be uh, explored. And the implementation of work from home uh, schemes for workers whose tasks can be done offsite. Now for we support for women, men and women who do not work due to unpaid work, it needs more nuanced approaches. So for example, the government have uh, put up e-commerce websites uh, that's created to, the, to support small and medium enterprises. So the question is, how can these um, e-commerce websites be fully harnessed by women? And we have to understand why these women choose a care economy over market work. Are they looking for economic opportunities? What are their skills? What kind of enterprise are they capable of putting? And what do they need to set up uh, and sustain such enterprise? So consultation is key as well. And lastly, data collection. So there has to be a data collection so that um, the we, so that we don't just end up being doing this descriptives. It should be spearheaded by the PSA in collaboration with various government agencies, such as the DOLA, the DTI, the ICT, and the P Philippine Commission on Women. I think I overshoot already, and that should be the end of my <laughs> presentation. It's okay, Connie. That was a really uh, clear and um, uh, comprehensive presentation. So um, 
really uh, your discussion of the issues in uh, platform work that uh, particularly affect women begs a deeper look into this new work arrangement as it really could uh, exacerbate existing gender inequalities um, and we'll have the chance to revisit those issues as well as re your recommendations during the open forum we also appreciate um, your uh, discussion of the results of that online survey that you that you were able to conduct uh, during the ECQ, which gave us um, sort of an overview of, of the effect of the pandemic on online work and online uh, workers. Okay, so friends, uh, let us now listen to the uh, second presentation. Okay, and flash on the screen are the authors of the paper titled Filipinos Access and Exposure to ICT, a general overview based on um, based on the National ICT Household Survey, which was uh, written by Dr. Aubrey Tabuga and Mr. Carlos Caballero. And to um, present the paper is Dr. Tabuga, who has been with uh, PIDS for uh, two decades and has worked on various research topics, including international migration and remittances, uh, poverty, uh, disability, gender, health and nutrition, um, uh, social protection and and social and uh, social networks. Uh, Dr. Tabuga's uh, PhD in public policy from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore, and she has a master's degree in public policy from the National Graduate Institute for Public uh, for Policy Studies in Tokyo, Japan. Aubrey, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Sheila. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to share our study on ICT use in the Philippines. Let me first acknowledge my co-author in this paper, Mr. Carlos Caballero, for his excellent uh, research assistance. Uh, next slide, please. So in this presentation, the objectives are to provide a general landscape of ICT use, of course, with emphasis on uh, assessing opportunities for platform work. We present findings um, on internet usage, ICT usage, um, namely cell phone, computer, um, and the usage characteristics. Also, the characteristics of individuals engaged in online work, um, which is, uh, by the way, limited to online selling, which is our key variable for online work that is available from the NICTHS. So while Dr. Condi presented the results uh, of a, a survey specific on platform work or platform workers, ours is about the general landscape of ICT use um, in the country using the NICTHS. Uh, in the end, we uh, we will provide or we will discuss our insights uh, for advancing opportunities for both men and women in platform work and in improving ICT use um, in general. Next slide, please. So as I've mentioned, um, this study was mainly an analysis of the NICTHS conducted by the DICT um, in collaboration with the PSRTI. It was done in 2019 uh, and it marked the first household survey done on ICT use, um, and it was administered to a nationally representative sample of households and individuals in the country. For our analysis, we applied mainly descriptive analysis, although we also did some correlational analysis um, to look into the characteristics of individuals engaged in online entrepreneurship. Next slide, please. Next, please. So we go to the general landscape of ICT use. Um, among all individuals in the country aged 10 and above, the survey found that nearly 80% or 79% use a cell phone um, within the past three months. And among those who use cellular phones, 94% reported they only have one unit, while the rest have more than one. And computer usage is at 34%. Um, while internet usage is at 47 percent. So these data show that um, it, it's wrong to assume that all cell phone users are able to access the internet. So only less than half of the population of 10 and above have access to the internet in the past um, three months or or who access the internet in the past three months because that's the reference um, period. Next slide please. This is not from the NICTHS, but I'd like uh, to show um, uh, that we are lagging behind most of our ASEAN neighbors in internet usage. Um, in fact, um, those who are behind us are only Cambodia, Myanmar, and Laos, and the rest, um, Brunei, Malaysia, 
um, even Indonesia, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam are all ahead of us. And I do not have such graphs for computer and cell phone usage, but this figure should already um, be useful in gauging our efforts vis-a-vis um, -vis other neighboring countries in the ASEAN uh, since we are we are working on or we are focusing on online work and online platforms. Next slide, please. In terms of how women um, fare vis-a-vis um, -vis men, we found that women are at par with men in many aspects um, of ICT use. So the percentage of cell phone users is slightly higher for women at 81% compared to men's 77%. And based on proportions, there are no significant disparities between men and women in computer and, uh, in computer and internet use. And based only on this, we are in fact uh, at par with or even on top of, of some developed countries when it comes to narrowing the gender um, digital divide. Um, women are also at par with men when it comes to percentage of those conducting online transactions, those using the internet for communication, and those who are using the internet for online learning. And um, notably, there are more women um, who are doing online purchasing than men. So it's 24% for women, 18% for men. And um, though these are not shown in this, in this graph, there's slightly more women who are more aware of online business transactions than men. So 51% of, of women and 47% uh, percent of men. And a higher proportion of, of women internet users, 11% um, have online buying and selling accounts in comparison to men, um, they have 9%. However, um, male online sellers earned more income in 2019 than female online sellers. Um, such comparison, however, requires a more in-depth study as we do not know the, the number of hours that they spend on online selling and we, do not, uh, we did not control for, for other characteristics. We will learn more about this, um, about online selling and uh, uh, entrepreneurship in the succeeding slides. Next slide, please. So in terms of details of internet usage, the device commonly used for accessing the internet is the cellular phone. 85% of internet users use their cell phones. Uh, meanwhile, 30% of, of internet users use desktop uh, computer. Only 19 use their laptop, while um, very few, 7% use tablets uh, to access the internet. Next slide, please. Majority of internet users access the internet through mobile data while in mobility. And nearly 4 in 10 or 40% said that they use um, internet at home. Over a quarter reported they use it when they are in public places like malls, internet cafes, restaurants, while only 14% are reported that they do access the internet when they're at work. So the, the above mentioned data show that while it's important to to facilitate the speedy improvement in, in internet coverage um, at home, for instance, for fiber connection, um, DSL maybe, it's crucial that uh, we upgrade the system, um, expand the number of cell sites, um, transmission lines, and other relate, related infra to improve mobile connections um, for accessing internet. Next slide, please. On frequency of use, um, majority of internet users access the internet on a daily basis. Some 38% reported that they do it less frequently, um, and about a quarter reported that they use the internet only when, when necessary. Next slide, please. In terms of purposes, 94% um, of users reported that they use it for social activities or for communication purposes. And interestingly, 44% noted that they use it to access information. And more than one third use it for leisure or lifestyle activities such as um, downloading music, online gaming, and, and streaming. And in this particular activity, um, there are more men, 44% uh, than, than women, 31%. And only 12% reported that they use the internet for learning, which is narrowly defined um, as engaging in online courses, academic research, accessing ebook and dictionaries. Meanwhile, only 14% said that they use it to access government websites uh, or services, which means that there is much to, to be done in, in e-government in the country. 
it's quite unfortunate that only 6% uh, use the internet for their professional lives, such as um, doing job search, um, business activities, activities online or professional networking. And um, only 6 to 7% use the internet for online transactions like banking, booking, reservations. And another small percentage used um, the internet for for navigation uh, and for transformation transportation. Sorry, and a very tiny uh, proportion of less than two percent use it for for creativity um, or for user generated content. Uh, but please remember uh, that this is pre COVID. Um, the the survey was done in in twenty nineteen. Next slide, please. Okay, so in relation to the low level of online transactions, majority of individuals interviewed are not aware that they can do financial transactions online. So 52% of, uh, of, of the respondents and the awareness level among women is slightly higher at 51% compared to, to men, 47%. And only about 10% um, have online bank accounts, while um, only 6% have electronic and mobile money account. Also, only 7% um, of individual respondents have online selling or buying accounts. And this proportion is comparable um, between men and women. Next slide, please. We also examined the, the reasons for not using the internet and the dominant reason is related to lack of knowledge on how to use the internet and what internet is about. And other important reasons are high cost of internet subscription, high cost of equipment. Uh, in, in this particular reasons, we found a significant uh, gender disparity. Um, a non-negligible proportion, 21%, also reported that internet service is not available in their area, which, which tells us that uh, there's really um, a lot of, of things that needs to be done in terms of infrastructure. And um, some reported that they do not need the internet um, that, so, that, so that they're not using the internet or they're concerned um, also with private, privacy and uh, security. Um, next slide, please. Now we move to the use of online platforms. Okay. The, the activity that is most commonly done by, in, uh, by, by internet users uh, when it comes to online platforms is the purchase of, of goods or services, where 26% of internet users reported to have engaged in online purchasing in the past 12 months. And this percentage is a bit um, higher among women, 29% um, than men, 22%. Very small proportions use online platforms for paying bills, online banking, online delivery of services, and online selling of goods uh, or services. And the prevalence of online investment or on online investing, such as stock trading and other um, such activities, do not even reach 1% um, of internet users. I think here it's only like 0.4%. Next slide, please. We examined details uh, of online purchasing and the most commonly used device for online purchases is the cellular phone with 80% reporting that they used their cell phones for making um, purchases online. On the average, online purchasers um, bought two times each month within the last 12 months and that there is no uh, there is no significant um, gender variation in this aspect. On a monthly basis, an online buyer had spent approximately 2,300 pesos on the average, and men spent more on the average at around 3,200 pesos compared to women's average purchase amount of 1,800. And most online buyers get uh, the merchandise via delivery or courier um, only very few or 17% reported that they do meetups um, to get their purchases. Now we move on to um, online entrepreneurship, um, which is limited to, to just online selling. Um, so the question in the survey is that in the last 12 months, have you performed any of the following online activities through website, social media, mobile application? And one of the options there is selling of goods or, or services online. And the survey estimated around 980,000 online sellers um, for 2019. And of these, 68% are women. Among the, these uh, online sellers, an estimated 26% uh, reported that this activity is their primary source of income. 
for the rest or three fourths of them, um, this is only a supplementary uh, rather than a primary source of income. And that is uh, true for both men and women. And um, one of the characteristics of online entrepreneurs is that they, they have skills with regards to ICT um, compared to, to those who are not uh, into this, uh, compared to the general population. Next slide, please. So with regard to online women sellers, uh, we want to, to know more about them. Majority of them are college educated. Um, some 23% have had high school education um, at most. And a larger proportion of these women online sellers are categorized as homemakers or housewives. And another significant proportion, 31%, are own account workers or self-employed. Um, interestingly, 11% um, of them uh, are considered unemployed in the, the labor force. And even the employed ones, 8% of, of employed uh, workers or employed women or online sellers uh, engage in, in online selling. So um, not only the, 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 um, the homemakers, but also the unemployed and the employed. Okay, so to, to get to know more about um, the characteristics of online entrepreneurs, we did a correlational analysis and we found that when factors are, are held constant, um, engagement in online selling is more likely for women, married individuals, and more educated persons and holders of ICT degrees are also more likely to, to enter online selling. And the likelihood of entering uh, online selling increases with age, though decreases at a certain threshold. And individuals that live in rural areas are, are less likely to engage in, in online selling. And when we compare um, labor force status, it was found that compared to, to employed workers, the unemployed, the self-employed, and students are more likely to sell online. Uh, interestingly, um, if you control um, other factors, homemakers are less likely to engage in online selling than uh, employed uh, workers or employed uh, individuals. So these are the characteristics of, of online sellers. Next slide, please. We now move to the nature of their activities. So the top products that are sold online are, are clothing, uh, footwear, sporting goods. Number two is cosmetics and fragrances. And number three is food, um, groceries. And number four is consumer electronics and accessories. Next slide, please. A significant proportion of, um, of online sellers utilize social media sites for selling their, their products online. And a greater percentage of women um, use social media platforms, like 80% of women, uh, but only 57% of, of male um, online sellers use social media. Some 11% use e-commerce websites like Lazada and Shopee, um, and a very minimal percentage use their own websites for selling their products. Next slide, please. And the dominant mode of payment is um, cash on delivery with 72% of online sellers reporting to me to have used such a uh, mode. And this is followed by making over the counter payments in remittance centers and convenience stores. And only very small percentage use electronic or mobile wallet um, or even debit and credit cards. Next slide, please. The average income earned from online selling um, in 2019 is at 7,700 uh, pesos per month. And earnings are markedly higher among male online sellers at 10,000 or nearly 11,000 compared to female sellers who made um, only 6,000 per month. And uh, a large proportion of, of online sellers earned 10,000 um, pesos or below each month on the average. And women in particular, 74% um, of them um, earn up to 10,000 um, pesos each month only. Next slide, please. So we also found that those who sell through their own websites have higher monthly earnings, perhaps because they, they, may, be, they may sell um, high price items. And those with their own websites are likely to be established once already, since having a website indicates their ability to invest on the, on the platform and marketing of, of their products. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, there are also important findings that, uh, from the paper that, and these are, um, there seems to be high confidence in using online platforms for selling stuff. The survey did not find lack of trust. It's a big issue. Um, the, per, the proportion of those who had trust concerns is a very low 4%, and um, the survey did not uh, find uh, uh, any significant uh, disparity between men and women in this in this response, in their response. Uh, 
instead of the trust issue, the more common reasons for not um, purchasing online are lack of interest or uh, preference to shop in person and lack of knowledge or skill uh, for online selling. And this lack of knowledge is relatively more common among older individuals um, than younger individuals. Next slide, please. We also found that online selling is recommended by majority of online sellers, um, or 73%, and majority of women sellers um, say it's a good income uh, source, like 81% of them, while a majority of male sellers say it offers uh, fast transactions. Next, please. For our recommendations, next slide, please. Um, the survey found that ICT offers a lot of opportunities that many Filipinos are confident in in using it in their in their business transactions, and are and are hopeful and positive in the benefits that they can that they can gain, gain through it. However, the low awareness and lack of knowledge uh, of many in using the internet prevent them from maximizing the gains from it. So efforts must focus on improving awareness, knowledge, and skills for using ICT. And I'd like to echo uh, what Connie, uh, Dr. Connie, um, mentioned a while ago, that there is a strong incentive to, to pursue policies for skilling the workforce on ICT use in particular and enhancing educational uh, capacity in general. Um, also remember that although, uh, for instance, women are comparable with men when it comes to the proportion of individuals having access to ICT, the problem is that the usage rate is way too low. ICT as a way to improve people's opportunities is still very much in its infancy, so to speak, because not many people are using it to advance their livelihoods, their opportunities, um, their very low levels of online transactions uh, out there. Of course, this is pre-COVID -pre and um, we will know later how this pans out during um, during or post-COVID. Hopefully, we will we will see um, the end of the tunnel soon. Uh, but in terms of focus, older people and those who have low education attainment must be targeted in efforts for skilling or reskilling. Next slide, please. Um, I did not um, discuss infrastructure because um, there are lots of, of PIDS studies on, and, uh, on the the NICTHS that, that work on this, but I'd just like to, to echo uh, that uh, many Filipinos still face a lot of infrastructural constraints in relation to their access to ICT. Therefore, gaps in, in infrastructure must be addressed. Improving mobile internet connections are crucial to further enable greater ICT usage for both men and women, and efforts must be made to streamline access to formal institutions and its processes such as banking and government transactions in an online setting. And lastly, uh, next slide, please. One of the policy issues, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Connie a while ago, is um, social protection. So the issue here is that online entrepreneurs also need uh, social protection, but because many of them are informal, they may not be motivated to, to enroll for such. And one of the ways in which social protection access can be broadened among users um, of online uh, platforms is through government's engagement or partnership with online platforms, especially social media platforms uh, where most online enterprising are being conducted. And these platforms, they can be incentivized to, to promote access to social insurance, become a channel for educating users on the importance of social protection and for participation. I think that ends my presentation and thank you for, for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Aubrey, uh, for your uh, presentation. Actually, I was particularly struck by uh, your findings on online entrepreneurship, which shows a lot of potential, but still largely untapped. But, you know, th those findings were pre-pandemic. Maybe there ha have been some um, uh, developments during the pandemic, as we can see, many online businesses have mushroomed. Online selling, we know, is a good opportunity for women to uh, work in their own time, which complements actually the findings of Dr. Dakoyko and crowd, crowd work. However, as we've seen in your presentation, there's still a lot of asymmetries in online entrepreneurship, as the more educated ones, the skilled ones, and those who have access to technology are more likely to engage in online entrepreneurship. So, friends, let us hear what our discussants have to say about the, the two studies, uh, the, the findings and recommendations of the two studies. So, at this point, let me introduce to you our uh, discussants. We'll hear first. Our conversation today would not be complete without the comments and insights of the country's um, labor and employment department. And we are honored to have with us today, once again, Ed Executive uh, Director Ama. Charisma Dobrin Satumba, uh, who heads the um, 
Institute of Labor Studies, which is the policy research and advocacy arm of the Department of Labor and Employment. Under ED Satumba's leadership, the ILS has geared this course in has geared this course in uh, in Dole on the future of work including emerging work in the platform economy. And before joining the ILS, Edi Satumba has worked, uh, worked in various DOLE agencies that promotes the rights and welfare of workers. She, she graduated from uh, the De La Salle University with a bachelor's uh, degree in political science. She's armed with a master's degree in public management from the Ateneo School of Government and in national security administration from the De National Defense College of the Philippines. Edi Satumba, the floor is now yours. Okay, Dr. Sheila, good afternoon. And to all our viewers, uh, magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. First of all, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Connie Dakuykuy for uh, her very uh, comprehensive and insightful presentation. No? And uh, it actually uh, complements and validates our findings in our previous researches on platform work, particularly on uh, decent work deficits of platform workers. Okay, so I'd like to proceed with my uh, 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 presentation. Next slide, please. Well, the Philippines was one of the first countries in Asia to ratify several international conventions in support of women, enacted gender sensitive legislations, and formulated policies promoting gender equality. Gender gaps in the labor market have persisted as evidenced by the low female labor force participation rate, as uh, what has been mentioned earlier by Dr. Corny. The labor force participation rate of Philippine women has stagnated between 47 to 50 percent for the past two decades. This is notably lower compared to the male labor force participation rate recorded at 77 percent to 80 percent over the same period. Based on existing literature, women usually drop out of the labor market during their prime years to assume child or elderly care responsibilities and other household duties. Next slide. As highlighted in the study by Dr. Connie Dakuikoy and Ms. Laura Bahe, the platform economy affords women with access to economic opportunities, which the offline labor markets cannot provide. The online labor market or the platform economy has potential of creating employment opportunities for women based on the following reasons. Number one, ease of access. Unlike traditional offline employment, platform work does not require a lot of eligibility requirements. Thus, it provides alternative employment opportunities even to those with limited education and professional experience. Number two, low entry barriers. Technology is deemed to be free of human biases. Algorithmic management and detailed monitoring ideally enable an objective comparison of workers' productivity. Workers may also choose to conceal aspects of their identity online to avoid bias. As a result, Hiring processes should be characterized by greater objectivity compared to traditional labor markets. And number three, flexible work arrangement. The promise of flexibility and the option to work from home allow women to engage in paid work alongside family responsibilities. But while these key features, the platform economy appears to be a viable solution to lingering constraints to women's participation in the paid labor market. Slide, uh, next slide, please. However, the idea of promoting flexible platform work as a, strategy, as a strategy for economically empowering women is not universally welcome. Some say that labor market inequalities may be aggravated by platform work. So what are two ways this can happen? First is the precarious, precarization of work. The flexible work arrangements or without employee-employer relationship in platform work chronically expose workers to insecurity since it operates outside the purview of labor regulations and social protection system, as what has been repeatedly uh, mentioned uh, in the earlier studies. In this context, the flexibility afforded by independent platform work does not translate to positive gender outcomes, since stability of earnings and better working conditions are prerequisites for women's economic empowerment. And second is algorithmic bias. In principle, Artificial intelligence may reduce humans' subjective interpretation of data. However, technology is not entirely autonomous because operational parameters are specified by programmers and configured by users. Bias in a way, big data is used may therefore lead to adverse outcomes for historically disadvantaged groups such as women. Next slide. 
So although there are reasons to believe that the platform economy offers immense prospects for women, the current evidence base, including the PIDS study, reveals that the same structural barriers to women's inclusion, which are pervasive in the traditional labor market, are also present in work mediated by digital platforms. Thus, it is important to have the right policy mix to address decent work constraints while harnessing the potential of the platform economy in terms of creating pathways toward a better future of work for women. Next slide. Cognizant of both challenges and opportunities afforded by the platform economy, the, the DOLE has carried out initiatives in the following three main areas. So number one is through research. The evidence based on platform work is presently insufficient to enable policymakers and other key actors to develop comprehensive responses toward ensuring that desired gender and decent work outcomes are achieved. Thus, the Institute for Labor Studies as the research arm of the DOLE has initiated several studies on platform work to guide policy formulation. Second is through extensive and meaningful social dialogue. Social dialogue has always served as the cornerstone for DOLE in the development of policies and programs, especially for emerging labor market trends and issues such as those surrounding the platform economy. On this note, the department has conducted consultation activities to provide a venue for stakeholders to tackle issues on platform work. More recently, a jobs summit was held in which platform workers were consulted and on, on possible strategic actions that may be included in the National Economic Recovery Strategy. Okay? And it was presented uh, during the May 1 Labor Day celebra celebration. During the said activity, platform workers also put forward viable action plans for medium to long-term implementation. Actually, uh, the platform workers really, really appreciated you know, their involvement in this consultation. Sabi nila, first time lang daw nila na, na, na invite sa mga uh, forum na uh, magde-decide, no? may mga policy making and decision making that will affect them. So, and third is through carrying out demonstration projects to test innovative solutions. This can be made possible through the Decent Work Country Program 2020 to 2024, which articulates the shared priorities of government, employers, and workers. Under the Decent Work Country Program, demonstration projects have been identified as specific outputs toward contributing to the attainment of decent work outcomes. Next slide. Okay. So as previously mentioned, no, ILS has conducted several studies to inform policymaking process. So in 2018, the Institute conducted a study on off-site work arrangements where work is performed away from the office at least part of the time, such as telecommuting, telework, or work-from-home arrangements. The study described this work arrangement as it is being practiced, including benefits and challenges. And during this time, the Telecommuting Act was still a pending bill. In 2019, a study on digital labor platforms was conducted to shed light on this emerging work pattern, including employment and working conditions. With increased online connectivity, business models have been reshaping and the nature of work are changing. Platform work has grown in scale and value that it significantly disrupted the general concept of normal jobs. Work or tasks are digitally, digitally mediated and delivered between service providers and customers. For this year, 2021, ILS is conducting a study on food and service delivery riders. Example, yung mga food panda, grab food, the grab deliver, Lala move, talk talk PH move on, etc., whose number has exponentially increased during the pandemic. The study aims to provide a descriptive analysis of their working conditions, perception of the nature and prospects of work, and the effects of the COVID 19 pandemic and how delivery platform business is carried out. So, next slide. The following are the key takeaways no, for the two completed studies. Okay. So, number one. Flexibility is the main motivation enabling work-life balance, especially for many millennials and women with family and care responsibilities. However, it somehow reinforces traditional gender roles, especially for women. At least for the study sample, women indicated that their motivation is to take care either of their child or children or old parents or elderly relative. Number two, another is autonomy that platform work brings. That is choosing when and how much to work. Other push factors are the opportunity to earn additional income and the availability for this kind of job, especially this pandemic. This implies that flexibility enables them to fit work in around other things in life, aside from the fact that it is very difficult to find a job at this time and can supplement their income. 
As ICT innovations, uh, number three, as ICT innovations enable one to work in any physical locations, whether at home or in cafes or, or co-working spaces, digital labor platforms created opportunities for productive activity as long as one has the tools and capacity to navigate the technology. This equalizes the playing field for those with this education, such as the PWDs, and not only to women. Okay. So another um, key takeaway is that um, changing work environment may have an impact on productivity and motivation. The choice to work anytime, anywhere make platform work popular and attractive. However, health and safety must not be overlooked. Setting minimum standards both for off-site workers, such as working hours and occupational safety and health, and platform workers, uh, for example, fair rates, fair competition, transparent rating system are necessary. So, next uh, key takeaway, while platform workers enjoy the benefits of flexibility and autonomy, they are exposed to vulnerabilities as their work operates outside the purview of labor regulations and social protection system, which calls for innovative approaches. The ambiguity in employment status makes workers in the platform do not fall into the scope of the labor law regulations and social security law. Consequently, workers are not fully protected by labor laws, including minimum wage rates, social security coverage, freedom of association, and the right to collective bargaining. And last, gig economy or platform work is one of the new transformations in the world of work. The need of an improved data gathering, uh, part, particularly for, from the labor force survey, to accurately capture the employment scenario with the new forms of work is highly valuable. Good policies such as having a clear definition of a platform work or worker requires good evidence. Okay, next slide. As I have shared earlier, the job summit consultations provided a venue for platform workers to discuss their issues as well as identify concrete action plans that may address decent work gaps. So what are some of these action plans now proposed by platform workers themselves? Number one is the creation of a technical working group, which will help define the nature of work and applicable standards in terms of employment in the platform economy. Second is the formulation of a model contract that will help guide new aspiring freelancers in ensuring that their terms of employment are fair and decent. And number three, pursuing innovations that will allow platform workers to access mandatory social insurance programs and their corresponding benefits. This may include exploring possible mechanisms in which platform owners will contribute to the social security premiums of platform workers. Measures must also be in place to make social security benefits portable, even in cases where workers should shift to another platform provider. And the last, is the development of appropriate training modules of platform workers taking into consideration their working conditions, as such as working hours and other specific needs. Um, next slide. Okay, and finally, opportunities to explore innovative solutions are available through the Decent Work Country Program. The following are the proposed demonstration projects which are relevant to the platform economy. And this might be a, a supported by the International Labor Organization. First is the development of a tripartite code of conduct for ensuring decent work in the platform economy. Second is the creation of an, a worker-led online rating system of platforms. No? Something like a trip advisor. At present, most platforms only seek feedback from clients. Thus, the proposed mechanism will intend to solicit workers' experiences with regard to the platform's terms and conditions. The rating results will be envisioned to inform policymakers of decent work gaps in a particular platform and help identify opportunities for action. A dedicated website containing the platform profiles and ratings may be set up to help create awareness among platform workers and clients. And number three, the third is the establishment of a platform cooperative incubation and acceleration hub. That's why I'm so excited that uh, Ms. Rush is uh, here with us, who is into a uh, uh, cooperativism in the platform economy, and I'm excited to hear her also. So this uh, platform uh, incubation and acceleration hub will provide support mechanisms and resources such as training, technology, and financial capital access to workers to facilitate their transition to becoming technology platform owners. The hub will be envisioned to apply the principles of social solidarity economy, where workers are considered as critical drivers of economic and social transformation. Platform cooperativism is being espoused as an alternative digital business model wherein the platform is collectively owned by workers themselves and prospective benefits are democratically governed and equitably shared. So 
Um, I think last, last, next slide, please. So that would be the end of my presentation. Thank you. Maraming salamat, um, Executive Director um, Satumba of the Institute of Labor Studies, Department of Labor and Employment. We are very glad to know that the DOLA is taking steps to address the issues in the platform, platform economy. The action plans that uh, you discussed and which will be included in the national economy recovery strategy are on point. Perhaps the question now is how to encourage platform owners and, and employers to cooperate. And we can talk more about this during the, the open forum. Friends, to have a balanced perspective, we also invited uh, someone who could articulate the challenges faced by online professionals like her. We are privileged to have with us today the chairperson of the Filipino Online Professional Service Cooperative, or, or POPSCO, um, Ms. Rochelle Rivera. Ms. Rivera started in the online workspace in 2013 as a virtual assistant, and she is into training, speaking, consulting, and business development. So from sharing her digital marketing and business development skills in her YouTube channel, she was able to grow her influence and network of online professionals and entrepreneurs alike. She also she led establishment of Popsco, a national cooperative that aims to raise the bar of the Filipino online professionals industry and help attain sustainability and growth in the virtual workspace. Rosh, the floor is now yours. Rosh, could you check your audio, please? Is it better now? Can you hear me, Sheila? Yes, we can hear right. you now, Rosh. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Let me just share. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. And I'm excited to present this uh, presentation to all of you. would like to say thank you first for giving us the opportunity to give our um, overview of everything that's been done, especially the PIDs. All right, um, with regard to online work terminology, let's get started. Oops, there, okay. Well, it has been discussed, actually free, freelancer has always been the first term that comes to mind when we talk about the online industry, but we wanted to be known as online professionals because that's what we really are and that's what we really do. So we would like to use that term from now on. In fact, that's also the same term that we um, suggested when we joined in the um, focus group discussion with the um, Senate Bill 1469 for the um, Digital Transformation Act um, by Senator Angara. Now, the on-demand work or the gig economy has always been um, the term being used for the jobs, the kind of opportunities that we can find online. However, there are different opportunities online that are available that starting from employment so we can really build our career online. There are also project-based or task-based and there are also specialized work, specialized project. There are also opportunities for business owners and entrepreneurs that will sell, that sells not just services and not just our products but also services. So they vary in two categories, the service, um, which uses, of course, either the platform or their own website and e-commerce platforms as well. So these entrepreneurs um, are what we call normally the agency owners or the subcontractors. When we say subcontractors, these are small entrepreneurs that are subcontracting or it's like they're selling um, the work that they're getting. These are some work that they may not know or that they can no longer handle because of uh, because of the volume. So they are subcontracting these two other online professionals. So that's creating more work and giving more work opportunities to others, especially those that are just starting in the online industry. And of course, there are other advocacy opportunities as well in the online industry. Next, um, the Senate Bill 1469, it's called the National Digital Careers Act. It, it is a created to prepare the Filipinos for the skills needed for the online professionals industry. And of course, to promote and strengthen the Digital Careers Act. This is um, being led by Senator Angara, um, the 1469 or the National Digital Careers Act. And this is also 
um, in support to the digital jobs PH of the ICT. So Senator Angara um, has been one of the uh, one of the few senators who are really advocating the the Digital Careers Act here in the Philippines. And if we're going to look at PayPal's 2018 freelancer, Global Freelancer Insight Report, it has analyzed 22 countries and Philippines has one of the highest number of online professionals per capita. So they, they said that we're about 2%, roughly 1.5 to 2 million Filipinos are working online, but this number has no definite um, data. So we, we hope that sooner or later we will be able to verify these numbers and hopefully um, there will be a more rigid research that can prove this number. And we feel that this number is no longer um, accurate because right now, specifically during the pandemic, it has ballooned. So we're estimating around 2.5 to 3 million Filipinos already working online, either within platform or outside the platforms. So in terms of platform work and crowd work, um, earlier there were mentioned, there were tracking software mentioned, and most of them are for entry level opportunities or for employment. Um, in fact, the online professional can choose not to take clients that um, has these tracking software. In fact, we can choose to, you know, just um, con uh, agree to contract with a client that doesn't track your time. So it really depends on how confident you are as an online professional on what your expertise are so that you can demand for a, let's say, deadline based um, working, working uh, arrangement. All right, and an online professional, whether intermediate and advanced, can choose to find work opportunities out there. There it is. Medyo nag-advance ako sa slide. All right, so it is. Next, on overaching issues, the platform issues about not approving tasks, but actually what's happening right now, it's, it's just, it depends on how big the client's organization is. So there may or may not be a process in place. Most often than not, it is just between the client and the online professional, um, they're the ones who are parang, they're splitting up the job, they're discussing what ta what kind of tasks to be submitted, what kind of what kind of milestones to, do they have, because that will be the basis for uh, for for payment. So for example, they may choose to be paid either based on milestones, based on periodic, let's say weekly or bi-monthly or based on task submitted and project completion. So technically, the online industry is really um, a fair field for everyone. There is no written um, regulation yet because most of the clients in the platform and outside of the platform are also small and medium entrepreneurs. So the success of these entrepreneurs would also mean the success and the stability of the online professional that they are contracting. Now, regarding asymmetries, for the risk asymmetries, platforms enforce bonds once a contract is in place. Um, most popular here is the Upwork. So, for example, if, um, for example, I am the online professional and I get contracted by a client, that client will be forced by Upwork to put a bond based on the value of what was agreed upon. So, even if I'm already starting work, starting the the work. Um, there is a bond that I can, there is an assurance that I can get my pay after I submitted the work. So most platforms are already enforcing that. And in terms of value asymmetry, online professionals earn more than a corporate government employee and they earn in dollars. In fact, if we're going to take a look, there's a link here. If you're going to click on the presentation, this link will bring you to the research on pioneer salaries and earnings potentials of an online professional which is primarily based on $1 to $100 an hour. And according to their recent studies, we are averaging $10 to $20 an hour already for um, intermediate or let's say advanced, intermediate to advanced online professionals. And then those um, starting are normally around $3 to $5 an hour, so they can start at that range. Um, about information asymmetry, continuous education lies on the online professional, um, not the government or industry as a whole. However, any support from various institutions is encouraged because the industry is fairly new um, and there is no 
although there is, but maybe uh, it's not yet popular to everyone, that there are different institutions that are supporting the online industry. What the, what the online professionals are doing is they are grouping themselves. They are um, in Facebook groups. They are helping each other disseminate some information, most information, in fact, so that most of them will learn from each other. About power asymmetry, he who knows how the business works has more opportunities and choices. Collaboration, virtual co-working spaces, and friendly online communities are encouraged to keep the industry growing. And that's what we're doing at FAPSCO, at the Filipino Online Professional Service Cooperative, because we know how hard it is to start working online, especially if you don't know anything, if you don't know anyone, if you don't know what you're doing, is, if what you're doing is correct or not, or if what you're doing is at par with what the client wants. Um, regarding over aching issues with with the lack of collective represent, representation although although it is true at the moment yes and that's the main reason why we try to build a national based cooperative that may represent the online industry in the future and our goal is to collaborate with more community leaders so that we can have a collaborative effort um, and voice in terms of, let's say, policy making, research such as this one. Workers as isolation. Earlier, I mentioned about the virtual co working spaces that um, we've initiated in FAPSCO, and we wanted that to be duplicated because we have also what we call the business centers. So, since FAPSCO is a national based cooperative, we uh, built different business centers from different provinces where we have more members of. And based on the co-working space idea, we are we wanted to duplicate that for the different business centers scattered within Philippines so that each business centers can have a more, what do you call it, intimate group for co-working space so that they would feel that they have um, office mate, a virtual office mate while working online. And then with regard to viewing each other as competitors, this is the kind of mentality that we that we are trying to um, improve on because we wanted to promote a healthier online working environment. We wanted to promote collaboration instead of competing with each other and promote a friendlier online communities because there's really a big ocean out there and there's a lot of fish that you know we can we can earn from. In fact, what what is being advisable is that um, we should try to fish in the bigger ocean. We should really try to grow ourselves so that we can catch bigger fishes. There's no formal mechanism to negotiate and address grievances. That's number four. We hope that we don't have to go through, you know, the grievance and the collective bargaining agreement process, just like the regular um, labor process here in the Philippines, because most of the um, the clients are SMEs, small and medium entrepreneurs who employ a particularly number of, of online professionals. So we don't go by the hundreds or by the thousands not like the regular uh, labor force here. So most of them employ two, three, four, maximum of 10 online professionals because they're also small. But through continuous education, we are trying to encourage online professionals to learn how to manage clients and uh, build re better relationships for clients so that they won't have to go through grievance process, you know, and everything like that. With um, regard to contractors with or without employee-employer relationship, yes, most online professionals has no employee-employer relationship, but um, we have the opportunity to ask for a higher pay depending on skills. So we are educating most online professionals to really um, reskill or upskill so that they can qualify or they can be more confident if they wanted to, you know, um, ask for a bigger pay. There's really no benefits, health, pension, etc., because um, we are not technically employed. Um, and as I've said earlier, we are based on how big the, the client's business will become. So if an online professional is already receiving more than the regular minimum wage, in fact, if the regular minimum wage is, let's say, an average of 500 pesos in the Philippines, an online professional is receiving 10 times more than that on a daily basis or even more. So they can really um, have the luxury to pay for their own um, insurance and health benefits and everything. And they should have better protection coverage. It was also discussed earlier. Yes, um, my point on that personally, um, because online professionals use their own equipment, um, but on a case-to-case -case basis, some clients provide equipment based 
on agreement. So I don't think there will be um, a, a need for better protection coverage in terms of equipment. Um, but uh, however, in terms of, let's say, working hours, in terms of pay or in terms of benefits, they can discuss that. In fact, an online professional can really bargain. But the problem is Filipinos are meek and shy. So they they are having a hard time asking, you know, for what they deserve or for what they want. And that's also something, an issue that we also wanted to address, especially during trainings. On working condition, um, on standard employment benefit, again, there's no labor standards because the scope of opportunity is on a global scale. So I think it would be, it would take more than, you know, a few years before we can really create a standard practice, specifically if we can really um, ask all those platform owners or platform managers to meet and really you know agree on a standard um on a standard uh way of, of getting the the online professionals to into their platform and really have this standard pay standard condition and everything employees rights and privileges Again, online professionals have a choice on what kind of working standard he or she wants, but that would also mean that they should be confident and they should have the needed skills in order to choose what they really want, what kind of work they really want. On stability and opportunity, it really vary, varies on your skills, it varies on your clients. Um, so what we suggest is to continuously upskill and reskill on working conditions, time, pay and safety, Again, they have more options. Though clients differ on various conditions in terms of pay, working hours, project submission, etc. So safety must be taken out of the equation since they work from home anyway. I, I, in terms of safety, uh, physical safety, that's what I mean. But in terms of working hours safety, it would really depend on the online professional itself because sometimes, most of the time, they wanted to get more work because they wanted to get more income. So we really have to keep on educating them what are the ideal working hours um, that is good for you, that is suitable for you, and what are the what is the kind of income that you wanted to achieve based on the kind of working hours that you want. Regarding gender issues, the male, female, and the stress level, there are really equal opportunities for men and women, and there's increasing number of women that are doing technical skills work right now. So we hope to be able to close the gap sooner or later. Account verification is needed before you can sign up to a legitimate site agency. So I was wondering how others are saying that they're using fictitious name that sounds masculine. It should, it is not appropriate and it's unacceptable. And I personally haven't encountered that. But if others are claiming that that is happening, let's see on what we can do about it. Women can also take care of her family while able to provide financially and feeling fulfilled. So this industry has really opened up a new opportunity for everyone, not just to women, but also to the PWDs and those who are also um, in their, what do you call it? Um, those who have, what do you call it? Those who are in their 60s and above, those who have retired already there. And then lesser stress for majority of online professionals unless they try to manage too many clients that they can no longer handle because you as an online professional can juggle two, three, four or more clients. In fact, there was a time that I, re I realized I was already handling six to seven clients on a monthly basis and it was so stressful. So it really depends on, an, on the online professional how they're going to manage their time and the kind of work that they have. Now about gender um, awareness and development it has been said earlier that it's widening the gap between men and women while we online professionals feel that the online industry is closing the gap because it's giving a fair opportunity for all um, for everyone not just for men and women those in the lgbt communities included those who, who are um, pwds and everyone who just knows how to use a computer. So as long as you're willing to take the risk to pay the price of, you know, really working um, so hard in order to learn the needed skills, then the opportunity is open for everyone. Although this online work is not for everyone because of the level of skill that is needed. Of course, flexibility depends 
it has been discussed earlier that flexibility depends on platform work. But what we say is that flexibility depends on the online professional. Because although the platform work offers a variety of online opportunities, it would still depend on the online professional on what kind of work they want to get, what who, what kind of clients they want to serve, and what kind of industry they want to get themselves into. Um, about platform work combination, work combination, uh, um, the online professional wants or chooses. So it really depends. In fact, I myself um, only worked for the platform for about six to seven months, if I can remember it right. And then after that, um, I went out of the platform and I was looking for clients on my own through social media marketing and uh, through relationship marketing. So that's what we're also encouraging everyone to do so that they can ask for a higher pay and they can ask for a better working um, working relationship with the clients. Um, with regard to work autonomy result in overtime intensification, intensification for men, um, it, it is not that much because the work autonomy can be exercised by the online professional's preference. So it's really up to you if you wanted to accept more work or if you want to reject it because you can really do that. Um, it's not like the normal um, supervisor and employee relationship or in you can hardly say no if they ask you to do an overtime here in the online industry we can say no all the time all right isolation and stress that's the reason why we're encouraging to create small groups of virtual co-working spaces for support group platform exercise control um, most control is on the online professional although if you will let you know, the clients control you because of the kind of of opportunities that they are putting, that they are placing um, on your table, then it's up to you. But then again, given the right mindset, given, given the right attitude, given the right um, skills, you can, as an online professional, control what kind of career path you wanted to go. Or if you wanted to become an online entrepreneur, you can do that as well. We just have to empower everyone so that they would know they're, they're, that the opportunities online is limitless. In fact, I always say this to my classes. The limit is just your imagination. Oops. All right. Now, I would just like to give an overview that the online industry as a whole is... Um, composed of choices. There's a lot of choices. It's like we're being um, placed in a, uh, in a, what do you call it, um, in a, in a boodle fight or in a eat all you can restaurant where you can choose if you wanted to grow your career, if you wanted to create a business, if you wanted to coach, whatever kind of business model you want or whatever kind of work you want it depends on you but the question is are you willing to pay the price because of course there's a price if you wanted a higher pay price you should of course learn more skills you should, you should of course um, gain more confidence you should be able to learn how to negotiate with clients but if you're okay with let's say five dollars seven dollars pay then uh, most likely the kind of work that you will get are those who are employment uh, type of work so it's really up to us online professionals so we also have a few recommendations and suggestions and i hope that we will really start using the term online professionals instead instead of freelancers because even barbers and mechanics are freelancers so we wanted to be um remembered as online professionals because we work professionally and online to better represent what we do and what we all are and please get advice from different industry representatives not just from beginners but also from intermediate and skilled online professionals and also the online entrepreneurs so that we can get um the, the correct information from different levels um, of people in the online industry and please involve the online professionals in policy making and project planning activities. So thank you very much for this opportunity. This is very nice. And support continuous education and an upskilling program like the Digital Jobs PH of DICT and other similar advocacies. One more thing, make registration and payment of Jews available online. This will really make all the online professionals go out there and register their business. Of course, the very important one is to strengthen the infrastructure for faster and stable internet connection. And of course, the creation of an app for online professionals well, welfare administration, just like the Overseas Workers Welfare Administration Act of RA 10801, uh, 10801 um, because we are also OFWs. 
2.0, we're also bringing dollars, but we're not going abroad and leaving our family behind. So we hope that um, there should be uh, a welfare administrator administration act for all of us. And hopefully, you will also continue to support online-based cooperative so that um, the, the idea of collaboration and co-managing a business that we all own would um, be would be uh, would be well known to all Filipino online professions because right now it's very new to everyone. In fact, when we uh, when we were submitting our papers in the CDA, they don't know what an online professional is, and we don't have a clear category. They don't have a clear category in where they're going to put us. So it really took us about a year in order to really finish everything. Um, our mission is to help the Filo Filipino online professionals achieve a more sustainable livelihood in the online workspace by providing support through continuous education, marketing, mentoring, and leadership equipping. And thank you so much for the ICT for helping us achieve that. And hopefully we will be able to encourage more um, government agencies and more institutions to support our mission and to be to be with us in the mission in our mission to really um increase the benchmark of the filipino online professionals and online entrepreneurship industry so i have also attached other references in case you might you know want to take this presentation you will also be you will also find the hood suites philippine Ch philippines report suites global report and pioneer freelancer income survey i hope i didn't get too much of your time thank you so much that was a really uh, interesting uh, presentation, uh, Rosh. No, you have answered point by point the um, the issues uh, presented by uh, Dr. Dakuikoy in her in her presentation. Maraming salamat, and I think you have uh, stirred so much interest in in some of in our participants that they are asking in the chat box how they can be part of Popsco. Hi, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, they can always uh, visit your website, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, how, uh, to re for registration requirements. Yes, they can visit fapsco.ph or they can go to facebook.com slash fapsco.ph for inquiries. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And uh, please stay for the whole duration of the webinar because we have questions for you. Uh, we'll just have a, um, a short uh, break before we proceed to the Q&A. So let us give our speakers, uh, friends, some time to breathe. Actually, some participants have sent me uh, questions, direct uh, messages saying that they are waiting for the poll. Okay, so flash on the screen is um, our poll for this week. So everyone is signed uh, um Welcome to answer our poll. Our poll question is, in the 2019 labor force survey, what is the percentage of women at least 25 years old who are working? What is the percentage of women at least 25 years old who are working uh, based on the 2019 labor force survey? Is it 74%, B, 51%, or C, 81%? Please key in your answer now because we will be uh, closing the poll in a few seconds not minutes seconds okay so we are closing the poll now when please yes it's just processing ma'am sheila 16 more seconds 16 more seconds so um i was uh reviewing our shot box and we already have plenty of questions for our speakers so just hang on there okay Okay, do we right, already have the go. results? Okay, the correct answer is letter B, 51%. So, and uh, 46 got it right. So, we will uh, uh, pick two names from the 46 uh, participants who uh, answered our poll correctly. And uh, those two names will be the winners of our poll for this week. And they will each receive a PIDS notebook. I will announce their names before we end our webinar for this afternoon. Okay, so at this point, um, our speakers are ready to entertain uh, your questions. So may I uh, request our uh, speakers, our two presenters, our two discussants to turn on your um, video so our audience can see you. And Connie, if I may address the first, there are several questions addressed to you which pertain 
to uh, the methodology of your study. So they are very much interested in the methods that you use. I understand if I correct me if I'm wrong that uh, yours, the online survey that you did is a rider. Tama? It's a rider to that uh, to the the ICT um, online um, initiative. Perhaps you can expound more on um, you, you said, and this is from Mr. Asterio Olandria, you mentioned you applied non-probability sampling methods. Can you perhaps share in detail your Waterloo and data retrieval? And then from Pamela Joyce Eliazar, um, also on the methodology, uh, since purposive sampling was used, how did the team determine who will participate in the study? Perhaps criteria can be briefly shared with the group. Okay, Connie? Can you um, start the ball rolling, please? Okay. Um. So as I already mentioned, and you already mentioned, um, the online survey is a writer activity to the digital jobs page training. So in terms of criteria, um, the criteria is uh, it they have to be uh, uh they have to be interested in the training and they actually signed. Uh, signed up for the training, so that that's that's exactly what just what we did. So that's why it's proposed in the sense that we don't really have imposed any sort of sampling okay. uh, frame. Um, so we just uh, uh, conducted the the online survey as as part of the digital jobs page uh, page training program. So uh, I mean, in terms of of, of uh, uh, methodology that, that that's just how it goes. So it's it's a writer mm -hmm. it's drawn, it's a writer, it's a writer activity, writer. and we don't have much um, elbow room in terms of choosing whoever is right. going to to participate. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's um, in terms of the retrieval. Uh, there was a question. Okay, can you? There was a question. Yes. Um. In in terms of the uh data retrieval, uh, did you uh encounter any problem when it comes to um retrieving um responses? All right. So the essentially what we did was we used the Survey Monkey platform. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So that that's the uh, where the online survey was encoded, and so mm -hmm. once the uh, participants or the respondents have uh, uh, responded completely responded it's going to immediately go to the uh, to the platform where we have access platform, to yes yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think this questions um show you know reflect their interest to to conduct probably a similar online survey now that we have the pandemic so face to face online data collection would be a um, would be a, a problem so thank you very much for uh, for that, Connie. Let us now go to the other um, questions. Um, okay. Okay. Um, here is a question for. Um, okay. Um, this is for Mamsha. Um, Edicha, although you have already covered this, and this is also from the same person, Mr. Astrio, Asterio Olandria. Um, where is Dolly now, in if any, in terms of online platform work uh, policies or implementation? And uh, Dolly's take on online opportunities, like, okay, yes, yes. Um, with all the reach, yes, we was asking with all the re, uh, studies conducted, where, where is Dolly now in terms of online platform work protection, so uh, protection policies? Okay. Uh, okay, I will be honest with you. We are uh, in terms of understanding, understanding mm -hmm. this emerging industry because uh, regulating the digital labor platform is really complex. Uh, when we uh, refer to online professionals, uh, cover the web workers, uh, right, Ms. Rush? But there are uh, two types of uh, of uh, workers in the platforms. You also cover the location partners, no? Um, uh, yung mga riders natin. So we are in the process process of understanding the industry. Um, mm -hmm. How does the business work? Who are the players? What are the levels of control? Uh, are are there levels of control, no? When it comes to the platform owners, the week, how can we establish um, um, 
uh, the, the type of relationship that they have is there really a, a no employer-employee relationship. So those those kinds of questions, no. And we've uh, been consulting um, our workers as well as plat local platform owners. So it is uh, like what you said, Dr. Sheila, it is quite a challenge of engaging uh, international platform owners and that um, uh, we have to think about it, how we can do it. Yeah, the, the the platform owners because uh a while ago you you uh, in in your comments you uh, reported on the uh, responses the the, the uh, suggestions of platform workers or for online professionals platform professionals but how about the um, employer's uh, point of view or a take on these uh, issues no mm -hmm. I can see uh. Um, Russia nodding her head. Uh, Russia, would you like to add anything to this? Uh, um, I mean, your response to this question. If, but before I go to you, Ms. Dr. Cha, um, Edi Cha, would you have anything to add? Hello, uh, is my audio clear? Yes, it is clear now. Okay, so as I said, now we are in the process of consulting um, our workers and uh, platform local platform owners as well. But yeah, it's a challenge to engage the international platform owners. And um, we are really uh, serious in um, implementing the action plans that we have included in the National That's Employment right. Recovery Strategy. And the fact that platform workers are included as a priority uh, group in the nurse, uh, it means that um, they have a uh, uh, how can I? How can I say this? Parang they've already caught our attention, no? Okay. Uh, and uh, well, we will be, uh, but we don't want to um, uh, set up um, uh, mechanis mechanisms quickly or or labor standards or, or formulate uh, labor standards uh, immediately without understanding the industry first, because it That's might right. really adversely affect them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is why one of the recommendations in your study is to have more studies on this more research, collect more data, which Dr. Connie also uh, mentioned in her, her uh, presentation. Okay, Ro Rosh? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Sheila. Well, um, it's really hard to really uh, create a policy on somebody, on something that is on a global scale because the online industry is very dynamic. For example, I have a an employee or employee relationship to one client, but I have... Uh, a project-based relationship to another client. Mm -hmm. So um, creating uh, uh, an, an across-the-board policy on something that is very dynamic and is ever-changing is really not easy to make. And that's why uh, also Sheila, uh, so Sheila uh, Cha mentioned earlier that instead of, you know, creating or improving the situation right now, we might end up really derailing it or causing more harm than, you know, fixing something. So there really is a need for uh, further study and to understand the different opportunities online and how we can educate the people behind it, not just the online professionals, not just the online entrepreneurs, but also on the client side, because there are also platform owners and clients of those platforms that mm -hmm. might be affected as well. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, Rosh. Let us now proceed to the question of Toranti Galura, and this pertains to uh, the so-called universal data allowance. Um, what are your insights in provi providing a universal data allowance for women and other marginalized sectors to promote equity in the distribution and enjoyment of digital dividends? Um, Aubrey, uh, can I... Uh, uh, throw this question to you and later on I can also ask uh, in, in case you have heard of this. Hi Sheila. Um, yes, I'm so sorry I haven't I haven't heard about that. Um, it maybe first time has other, to, yes. yeah, other terms maybe or uh -huh. other concepts um, in mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm. um, but for it's me, okay. it's, it's a bit, yes. Yes, it's okay. No problem. Connie, have you heard of this uh, term universal data allowance? But if mm -hmm. it's saying something about allowance, so I would assume this has something to do with money. <laughs> sort of probably it's uh you know giving uh some, some data allowance and eh, right. no? so that more people can access probably the internet have uh you know wait uh 
I can see Rosh na, uh, raising her hand. Rosh, can you enlighten us on this, please? I, <laughs> thank you, Sheila. Um, I think if I'm correct, okay, please uh, tell me if I'm wrong. For the one that's asking question, I think that uh, he is uh, concerned on the data allowance in terms of the internet usage. For example, right now, the minimum, if you, let's say, if you uh, load, let's say, a 10 MB worth of a data allowance, um, it, it's not enough to, let's say, to be used for a day if you're going to, let's say, um, attend an online class or an online webinar. So I think they're talking about that to increase the data allowance of uh, the subscriptions in terms of, let's say, purchasing a smart or globe or subscriptions in terms of uh, internet connectivity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The the, uh, the one who asked the question, Mr. Florante, said, correct po. So I... <laughs> So yeah, yeah, he was he was in agreement uh, uh, with regard to your to your explanation on uh, what universal data allowance is. Uh, sabi niya, cash allowance for internet connection proposed at the Dig ADB Digital Forum last 2018. Thank you very much, sir, for your uh, question and clarification. Okay, other we have other questions and so. May mga questions dito pertaining to on uh, pertaining to uh, how to you know solve infrastructure issues, digital divide. But uh, we have already tackled this in uh, our webinars in the past. So I encourage you to please um, um, go to our website and our Facebook page because we have all all the recordings in our uh, from our past webinars. So maybe we can have uh, entertain other questions. Um, okay, I I have a question. This is something that's you know. Um, you know about the minimum wage for platform work and i think it's it's setting a minimum wage for platform work is a bit complicated since workers are paid per task or uh, project and not per uh you know not per hour so however do you think it is possible that, uh, to set a task based minimum wage so for example there is specific uh you know pay for a, a, a minimum wage for similar work. Do you think this is this uh, option is possible? Possibly kaya yon. Um, director Cha, Idi Cha. Yeah, okay. And then I will ask to uh, Rosh. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's uh, this that's really what we don't want, no, you Dr. Sheila, you may race to the bottom with regard to minimum wages. With regard to wages, no? I say that's what is happening with uh, online professionals involved in elementary occupations. Okay. No, Rush, okay. Um, Rush is a lot of better because siguro ma, ma online professionals sila so ilalim mga architects, mm -hmm. engineers, uh, they mm -hmm. get good uh, ano, uh, rates, no? But good rates, those, yeah. yeah. But those doing elementary occupations such as uh, minyo, minya, parang man, ma typing, encoding, mm -hmm. I think uh, parang mas mababa yung ano nila to negotiate. But um, yeah, setting minimum rights for online workers is uh, is an agenda. But um, I'm um, at this point in time, it would be difficult to have a standard, no? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, um, I think um, um, we have to. Uh, there, there are uh, there are uh, opportunities uh, to to for us to be able to do that. Um, through um, really social dialogue. That's the only thing we can do, social dialogue, that consultations pa rin, no? And, mm -hmm. um, and uh, involvement of workers. If, if we can uh, help uh, workers um, with negotiation skills, no? Yes. Um, I think it would be, uh, no, they would be able to, you know, uh, get higher rates for themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good point. Rochelle, uh, Rosh? Any, any, what's, what's your take on this? Thank you, Sheila. Um, what Cha mentioned earlier about raising to the bottom, it's actually bidding to the bottom when we go to job bidding sites. And that's what we don't want. Um, what we're doing is that we're educating co-online professionals in order to we learn negotiate. how to negotiate. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when, um, yeah, when Cha, Cha mentioned earlier that there are menial tasks, for example, typing, uh, mostly typing um, are being 
tagged us like uh, three to five dollars an hour. But most um, online professionals doesn't know that they can also re uh, ask for the same task for twenty five or thirty five dollars an hour based mm -hmm. on how um, how how you brand yourself. If you okay. brand yourself as an employee, then they will pay you like an employee. If you brand yourself as a professional, as a consultant, then you can ask. In fact, I myself um, was able to get jobs that are $25 an hour with the same jobs that are being priced at 2 or $3 an hour. That's why education is the key. It's not just setting up the minimum wage. It's, it's right. the, we're, we're, we're having these limiting beliefs. That's why we're also we're always afraid of the minimum wage and what our rights and privileges are. But what we don't know is that we can create an opportunity and we can create far more than the minimum wage that you will earn. The income potential is really endless if you know how the industry works. And with regard to the question that I'm seeing right now, not all online professionals are paying taxes because we don't know who they are. We don't know what they do and how how much income they have. Uh, personally, I pay my taxes. I'm a registered single proprietor, but that's why we're also encouraging everyone to go out there and be registered. However, the government mm -hmm. system right now doesn't know where to classify us. In fact, when I went to the DTI to register my business, they don't know what a website is. So maybe oh, we okay. also, yes, we also have to um, educate th those in the front line, in the DTI, in in the mm. uh, in the BIR to classify online professionals as really professionals because we're really normally as unemployed and we can't even apply for loans we can't even get uh, you know um, a bank account because they mm -hmm. thought that most of us are scammers or you know just getting money from indecent kind of jobs. Okay, I think what um, some of the points that you mentioned is uh, are related to this question uh, from Lisa Garcia to all panelists. Sabi niya, the DTI, DOLE, and the ICT have their own policies on the regulation of digital platforms and startups. Do you think that there should be a single focal government agency that should be in charge when it comes to platform economy or platform work? Um, any thoughts on this? Uh, direct. Director Cha Idi Cha, any thoughts? Do you think that ba may single agency dito? Or it's just really a matter of, you know, synergizing or harmonizing, you know, the different policies of um, our uh, government agencies um, on, on uh, the digital economy? Um, okay, it would be difficult for one government agency to address all the issues of platform workers. For example, uh, on the part of the Department of Labor, we can only address issues that are related to uh, labor standards. But when it comes to, uh, uh, for example, as what has been mentioned by Roshno, uh, business issues, that would uh, be uh, really uh, other government agencies. So I guess uh, we really have to work together. No, because right now, um, parang, uh, uh, it hasn't been in an, in the agenda yet of, of of government agencies, but with the with the recovery strategy, strategy that I think uh, uh, we're in a good position now to to really discuss the situation of platform workers and you know uh, work together. Thank you very much, uh, Ilicia. Um, Rosh, there's a, another question here, and and it, it's it it is about uh, rating. Uh, hold on. Um, does FOPSCO have a, have a system or a mechanism similar to what was mentioned by ILS on rating online uh, platforms or probably online um, platform uh, employers, no? So that we know if I'm a platform worker, I will know who, the, who to choose if I am confronted or I, uh, I have offers from several platform workers to see if that, you know, that would be the best employer for me. Um, no, there isn't. Um, imagine, imagine yourself in in the ocean and you're catching fish. Um, in in one throwing of the net, you will catch different kinds of fish in different sizes and different uh, different kinds, variety of fish. That's what the industry looks like. Para siyang isang dagat na maraming maraming isda na hindi mo alam anong isda yung masarap, yung 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 pasustansya and everything. It's really like that. So. It's really up to us online professionals to um, really understand uh, the kind of client that we're dealing with. We need to do diligent research before we talk to a client. We need to research them, uh, their business, uh, the kind of uh, work that they're giving, because not all of them will give us decent work. In fact, there are a lot of 
um, clients there that will give you adult um, content or adult kind of work stuff. So it's up to us if we are going to accept them or not. So there's really a variety of playboards out there. Mm -hmm. So you were saying it's up to, of course, the person if he, he or she will accept the work. But yes. um, I, I, I wanted to, um, you know, pursue um, this question and ask uh, Edisha on, on what what on the role of the dolly on this because obviously you know this isn't part of decent work, work already if you are being given such kind of you know assignment so what help can you know the government like the dolly can you know can um, can extend to the platform worker if he or she is confronted by this kind of an issue okay what maybe I, uh, what we can really provide is uh, to really have an enabling environment no for for platform workers to have um, parang to develop their skills, uh, different types of skills, no? as what has been mentioned, um, um, not only the technical skills, but in terms of negotiation, negotiating skills. Um, because uh, what we can only, uh, we can only come up with poli policies no? that will um, cover um, owners who are in the country. Okay? But, uh, uh, our laws do not apply to uh, international um, uh, players. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. I, I think uh, other government agencies also can 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 help us. No, uh, especially those who are who have partners uh, in uh, in uh, in host countries. No, sabi uh, ni Rosh, they are actually OFWs. So mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. now we we can. Uh, that's the, that's uh, that's the really a uh, revelation for us, no? If you are OFWs working here in the Philippines, what kind of policy should apply to you? So yeah, those, are, yeah. those are also questions, Dr. Sheila, that uh, we are also trying to answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Thank you very much, uh, Edith. Let's go back to the study, and I have a question here. Uh, Connie, probably you can answer this from Jennifer Oliodo. So have the studies um, considered the level of women's of women's engagement between the reproductive and productive responsibilities and how these affect the equitable access and provision of platform work and other online engagements. So I think uh, the online survey that you conducted focus, focus on, on particular issues. Uh, parang wala itong part na to ano Miss Connie? I think we are we covered some parts like for example um we ask questions on whether they do care work. Oh yes, or, yes. Yeah, care economy while they're doing platform work and in fact we we presented in one slide there um our results on platform uh, work hours meaning mm -hmm. uh, and our findings is that the flexibility that uh, that is supposed to be a uh, uh, this uh, sorry an advantage or a selling yes. point of the mm -hmm. uh, platform work. Uh, it, it it kicks in, but only uh, the, when people are doing minimal care work. So that's why yeah. in the recommendation uh, we are advocating for uh, you know policies for care work or care economy. Yeah, and I think in one of your slides you showed that beyond three hours beyond participation in care work already decreases and reaches zero, zero but right. Right. right so so that means are the like, implication yeah. kaya nito miss miss connie so so that that means because we only have 24 hours per day and mm. um, you know you can only do so much in a day and if you're spending so much time taking care of people yeah, that, that, that means that it, it's it's not like if you spend like five hours of doing care or care work you can immediately go to to think do something that's a really macro task or requires specialized skills if it's just typing maybe but if but if it's more of specialized like doing um, web design or something like that then it, it takes time because work needs momentum yeah right? so so mm -hmm. you know my take is that uh although it 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 boosts some flexibility. Um, the flexibility may not really be um, uh, platform work. May not really be uh, how do you say this? Um, 
Yeah, there's there's really a, a conflict between market and non-market work, and it has to be addressed, regardless whether we're talking of more uh, offline work or we're talking of uh, online work. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, Connie. Okay, um, we still we only have um, you know ten minutes left, so let me um, um, pick um, the last uh, uh, two questions. So. Okay. Um, this one, if I may, add, this one is for um, Dr. Aubrey. So he, okay, the question is, um, since uh, the data that you presented are pre-COVID data, uh, well, I think this is a question that can be better answered by the ICT, but you may have an idea if the DICT is planning for another data collection. So there will be, uh, you know, good comparison between pre-COVID, what was happened, what, what was the result before the COVID, and then after the COVID, what has been, if there any, uh, if there's any development, any change, mm -hmm. Aubrey. Um, yes, thank you, Sheila. Unfortunately, I don't know the plans of the ICT. Um, if anyone here from the ICT um, is present, maybe they can they can shed light on this. But definitely, it's it's um, an important survey that they need to do again. It's a national survey, and it should cost. Um, so I don't know about the, the the rounds that they have planned for this, but um, definitely we will see a lot of changes. Um, given this this trends in in online works and even online businesses um, here and there in in our communities, no, and na nila. So um, we might see um, significant change. Because before we thought matas na tayo, eh, because we have this international surveys, di ba? Surveys, Saying so. that we we Filipinos spend ten hours a day mm. in social media, um, it seems that that is not correct, oh. and it seems that we're lagging behind uh, in a mm -hmm. significant way. So we're we're just above Cambodia, Laos, and the other and mm -hmm. only three of them. But Vietnam is already, you know, 60, mm -hmm. 60 something percent. But mm -hmm. yeah, I hope that I don't know. Um, I hope the ICT will will conduct another I'm not sure if PSRTI will be the one conducting again but yeah I'm not privy to, to the, the schedule of the next um, NICTHS I'm sorry mm -hmm. thank you very much Aubrey so okay uh we have let me pick another question um uh, okay Hold on, hold on. Okay. Okay. Okay, just to um, uh, close this uh, open forum, let me just ask our um, speakers, our presenters and discussants for a few uh, brief remarks, um, starting off with Connie, and then Aubrey, and then our two um, discussants. Connie, please. Hi. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, I was hoping that I'd be the last so I can think better. But anyway, so I just have two things. Uh, one is uh, I really like the idea that um, we have to focus on because it's it, as uh, Director Charles said, no, um, the it, it's very difficult to to pick a policy and then apply it to a certain segment and then um, you know make this policy like like uh, that applies for all. But I think that um, there are certain policies that can be done that that uh, can be beneficial to everybody. Like for example, policies on skills development. Um, and Director Cha had pointed out earlier something about negotiation skills, and I really like that idea because um, I, I I'm of the opinion that the uh, skills that are needed on platform work are really not that different from the skills that are required from off offline work or, or, right. or non-platform work. These are skills that, uh, you know, for example, uh, we, we uh, offline work, we need communication, we need negotiation, marketing, bar branding, complex problem solving, critical mm -hmm. thinking, creativity, et cetera, et cetera. These are also skills that are needed in offline work. Yes. So there has, mm -hmm. you know, the, well, uh, there's no conflict there. So th what I'm trying to say is that, Although there are there are policies that 
really need to be nuanced. There are skill, uh, there are policies that can can be um, or initiatives that can be strengthened or improved uh, that can be beneficial to everybody. So that 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 is one. And then the the second thing is that I, I agree um, with um, uh, Roch uh, when she said that. Um, um, getting advice from representatives uh, coming from different levels of uh, platform professionals, beginners, intermediate and advanced. So, I, but I think that online professionals, they have different stories from workers who are doing micro tasks or menial tasks. As the director Charpai, uh, correctly pointed out, um, these are tasks that have low value adding. And I think that in terms of policies, these people, the ones that are on the beginner uh, be beginner uh, level, they are the ones that will benefit more from policies. So if ever there are persons or people or respondents that we would like to focus on, maybe the persons that we have to focus on would be would be the the, the beginners. Um, the beginners level. I, I have some more, a few more, but I but I'm not going to hold the floor, Sheila. So take 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 the floor. Okay. Thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Connie. Okay, Aubrey, would you like to um go next? Actually, uh, about the the question on the um uh, follow up to the D the ICT survey, yes. we have a yes. we receive a response from uh, Mr. Alex de Vega of uh, the ICT, and he said that they are planning to have a second round of the of the uh, national of the uh, national ICT household survey 2022 and they have already received oh submitted a proposal to the submitted. NPSA thank you thank you for that Alex Aubrey yeah uh, thank you Sheila I think um uh, Dr. Connie and our um, in our discussions have already pointed out a lot of things. Education and, and training um, should be um, on the top of the priority and understanding and knowing, as, as Director Cha mentioned a while ago, knowing and understanding this. This is a very complex and very new industry. Um, pwede kang online seller, pwede kang online worker, pwede kang um, grab, uh, grab express. It's it's so broad and we need to understand. And even sa tax, no, no kailangan natin ng physique, wala tayo dun sa physique. But then, yun talaga, we need to define concepts kasi before we can even regulate, we need to do more of the facilitative um, before we can even regulate, understand, research. And I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to learn about the research of ILS. And also, we need to do more of this at PIDS and other researchers um, in the country because we have our own context. Importante din na yung mga concepts natin, ma define natin sa sarili nating um, context and conditions. So, I think that's one. We, we as much as we want to lay, say minimum wages here and there, it's, it's very difficult right now. It's, it's a very, um, as, as I said, uh, complex um, industry and very still in its in infancy. Nag evolve siya, no? Uh, mm, very fast. True. So very we, fast. We, we shouldn't be there. We should be more on the understanding and facilitating with this environment so that we can gain more from it. Our, our people gain from it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Aubrey and um, Elisha. Your you. um, some uh, final remarks, please. And perhaps you can also ask, may, may pahabol kasing question dito. Do you think that platform work calls for another category of workers or, emplo or employees? Baka <laughs> pwede mo answer mo na. Galing kay Mira eh. <laughs> oh, I struck my, ano, eh, my attention eh. Sabi ko, itanong ko na rin to. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the the vision no, of the Department of Labor is really decent work for all workers. So rest assured that uh, we are committed to in, uh, ensuring decent work for platform workers. But we have to really be careful no, and take all the necessary consideration so that we come up with a policy that is needs-based, okay? Mm -hmm. And that will not adversely affect the, the, the workers that we want to protect. So in terms of their rights at work, in terms of their employability, skills development, social protection, and their representation and voice, no? So yun, yun lang po yung aking message. As to that question, um, it's really something to think about kasi um, when we were developing the economic strategy, no? So sabi na, sige, priority ang women, ang youth, priority yan, yun ang ganon. Uh, formal sector, informal sector. And then sabi namin, let us include platform workers because they are not 
uh, uh, included as a formal sector as defined by the labor code. Mm -hmm. They are not included as, as informal sector as um, as understood by our informal sector workers. No? So parang kawawa naman sila, hindi nila natin alam kung saan sila. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's something to really think about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edith uh, Sha. And of course, last but not the least, uh, Rosh. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, although um, everyone is saying this industry is pretty new, um, the online industry started or the term virtual assistant started in 1996 or 1997. So we are already, right now we're just learning from the West who have done this before us. And this is really dynamic. Um, just like the cell phone, it's being outdate outdated every two to four weeks. The online industry is also evolving every two to four weeks as there are new applications, new technology that are being introduced in the market, new approaches, um, the destructive, uh, destructive, uh, disruptive uh, marketing strategies come he come and go um, on a uh, on a timely basis. But then again, policies are good to be in place, specifically on what Connie said earlier that those who are starting, those who are in the entry level, that will benefit from it. But also, it is imperative that we. Um, we do it, we do an education awareness hand in hand together with policy creation like increased awareness of the people that there are government agencies that there are government programs that are giving free free training so that people will be aware so that people will be given a chance to be part of this online industry and you know earn from home earn dollars from home and i hope that this online industry will be um, well known within five or ten years time and then everybody will have an equal opportunity to earn dollars from home so that nobody will have to go you know abroad anymore and leave their families behind thank you very much rosh Friends, um, please join me in thanking our presenters from TIDS, Dr. Connie Dacuikoy and Dr. Aubrey Tabug, and of course, your able assistants, Mr. Carlos Caballero and Ms. Lo, uh, Lori, uh, Laura Baje, and of course, our discussants, Executive Director Chasa Tumba of the Institute of Labor Studies and Ms. Rosh Rivera of the Filipino Online Professional Service Cooperative for the valuable information and insights they shared with us this afternoon. Let us give them a big virtual clap and thanks to all our participants who participated in the open forum. I'm sure you have lots of takeaways from today's discussion. So allow me to just to, to close it by focusing on, on uh, just three ways forward that I, we can glean from the presentation and comments shared by, by our speakers. So first is, is the importance of continuously collecting data on the platform and conducting uh, more research, more studies to guide our policymakers, craft evidence-based um, policies and programs that can make our, our social protection systems, labor and employment policies and skills development and training systems more responsive to emerging work arrangements. Second is by addressing the issues using a multi-stakeholder whole of society approach. Clearly, the issues uh, they raise cannot be solved by the government alone. It needs the engagement and cooperation of platform workers and uh, employers. And also, given the uh, cross-border uh, border nature of platforms, the international development community also has a significant role to play. And third is they need to address access issues due to poor infrastructure, slow or uh, no internet, lack of computers, prohibitive internet costs and lack of knowledge and skills to use ICT tools. Okay, so uh, to close our webinar, before I do that, here are the two winners of our poll for this week. Uh, the winners are uh, Marie, Maria Lulu Reyes and Lloyd Joy Bohai. Maria Lulu Reyes and Lloyd Joy Bohai won in our poll today so our webinar team will contact you for your price okay the delivery of your price so um just a few, uh, for uh, close you can access all the, uh, the presentations from the pids website and also the links to the full studies of dr dakoy and uh um dr tabuga and uh, please um Okay, help us in improving our webinars by answering our survey. The link is flashed on the screen. And in case you did not catch it, uh, just um, send us an email. And uh, for our webinar, of course, uh, next 
Okay, our website and, and uh, social media pages. Um, thank you to our social media followers and to all those who uh, watch our webinar this week on our uh, Facebook and um, and uh, tune in to our uh, Twitter for the uh, highlights. And we have the following webinars in June. On June 3, another webinar on the digital economy, uh, paving the road to the Philippines digital integration with the Asia Pacific. On June 10, we will have um, the, a webinar on uh, the Philippine regulatory policies on solid waste, waste management. On June 17, we'll have a webinar on agrarian reform, um, focusing on improving the land tenure security of farmers and the role of agrarian reform beneficiaries organizations in enhancing agricultural productivity. And on June 24, we'll have a webinar on senior high school graduates, prospects and challenges in the labor market. And finally, we would like to thank all the um, representatives from the government, private sector, um, academe, uh, civil society and, and media, um, who uh, join us today. Maraming salamat po. We hope to see you again in our future webinars here at PIDS. So this uh, um, concludes our uh, virtual event for this week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Hi, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Salamat po. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Congratulations to the PIDS. Thank you, Edith Shah. <laughs> Suki. <laughs>